We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. William Shakespeare, The Tempest. This interview that I, Dr. Jamison Neruda, conducted with Sarah exposes a fundamental deception that affects humanity across every dimension of life. This deception is that our three-dimensional reality and human consciousness have been programmed to be perceived as real, when they are not. This is clearly a very bold assertion, and is not made lightly. In this interview, I explain the forces behind this deception, what their agenda is, how humanity has been enslaved from its inception to today, and what we can do about it. It is, understandably, an unsettling narrative. After all, it exposes a reality where humans are biological hosts of infinite beings, suppressed by deceptive programs designed by entities from a different dimension. Humanity is unaware that we live in a designed reality, and that that designed reality includes everything. Over the past 15 years, there have been individuals who have written and spoken about certain aspects of this deception. From the scientific community, individuals like Herman Verland, Dr. Robert Lanza, Leonard Susskind, Gerard Zehuft and James Gates. From the technical field, NASA engineer Thomas Campbell. From a more philosophical perspective, authors like Nick Bostrom and Anthony Peake. Scientific papers, too, have been released in this emerging field of reality definition like Constraints on the Universe is a Numerical Simulation by Bean, Davuti and Savage. These individuals, and others like them, are hypothesizing that our universe was designed through mathematics or computer code. This topic is relatively off-limits, reserved for theoretical and heretical thinkers. It shocks people significantly more than the discussions of UFOs or government conspiracies, because it is so fundamental. It is our reality, and the only logical conclusion we can draw is that we are prisoners in a deceptive reality. It makes reality feel like a lab, and we are the unsuspecting lab rats. From the spiritual side, many of our mystics and religious founders have reported that both our perception of the universe, and the universe itself, is an illusion. This theme is consistent in religious and spiritual writings throughout the ages. And while the mystics lack the scientific vocabulary to define the scope of this illusion, they nevertheless understood that we, as individuals, walk our lives through an illusory world that scientists are increasingly describing as a programmed reality. The question that rises to the top is, who or what is programming our reality and why? It is to this question that this interview seeks to answer and explain in layperson terms. It is understandable that those with a scientific or religious training will find this disclosure difficult, if not impossible, to believe. I am not trying to convince anyone, I merely present a narrative for how this happened, why it happened, where it is trying to lead humanity, and most importantly, how we can break out of the programming, all of us. This interview was not concentrated on the scientific realm. The science behind the hologram of deception is not based on the mathematics or physics of our space-time. Its complexity and sophistication is well beyond our current understanding, so the attempt to define it in scientific terms would be an impossible undertaking. Even if it were possible, it would only muddle the real import of this information in arcane vocabulary and mathematics. The true focus of this interview isn't the scientific definition of the hologram of deception, but rather how we can free ourselves from its pervasive and illusory presence. The sovereign integral process is defined in this interview in detail, but you may have to listen carefully to it and understand it. This process is truly the centerpiece of this interview. Whatever philosophical perspective you wish to attach to this information, Bear in mind that it is shared in the spirit of oneness and equality, and that the sovereign integral process is a decidedly experiential practice. As thought-provoking as the backstory and the chessboard of reality, as depicted herein, may appear, it is the behavioral adjustments that are the real purpose of this disclosure. 
The Wingmaker's materials are not focused on knowledge or spiritual experiences. They are dedicated to the new behaviors that support the ongoing unfoldment of the sovereign integral process on Earth within the human species. It is this process that you are really experiencing in this interview. Whether you believe in the existence of the hologram of deception or not, the sovereign integral process remains available as a tool to use in your daily life. What we discussed Wednesday night has been swirling around me ever since. I think I've become a bit obsessed with all of this, what for me, anyway, is new information. I'm trying my best to process it into my mental framework, and I have to admit, I'm not sure it's working. I understand. I've held back some information for this very reason, not only for you, but also for those who will ultimately hear this. When we ended the last session, we agreed to spend more time on the Grand Portal. Is that what you're referring to, or is it something else? It's all related. It's a very, very big picture, and broad timeline. Can you share it now? Let's take it one part at a time. With your questions, I hope it will all come clear, but I have to warn you, that it will seem a little unwieldy or odd until the whole of it is out. Okay. Where do you want to start? I think we need to go back to the beginning, to understand the true context of the Grand Portal. The Grand Portal is defined in the Wingmaker's materials as the irrefutable, scientific discovery of the human soul. Okay. Earth was, and is, a very unique planet. It was entirely of water, originally. But what made it interesting to beings, was the fact that its core enabled it to have a gravitational force that supported manifestation. What do you mean by manifestation? That it began to traverse from an interdimensional planet of sound frequencies, to a planet of matter, a physical matter. Its gravity-producing core, or nucleus, was able to literally create the conditions that allowed it to materialize itself over eons of time. How do you know this history? There are records of this on the disk that was taken from the 23rd chamber at the ancient Arrow site. But some of this we knew from other documents we've retrieved from the Sumerian record that have not been widely distributed. We've also had discussions with the Cordium that bear this out. So Earth started out as a water planet and it wasn't physical? Correct. This was when the Atlanteans lived within the planet. They were the race of beings that inhabited Earth at the time of its formation. The Anunnaki came to them and negotiated an agreement to allow the Anunnaki to mine a substance near the core of the planet. That would be, in its essence, what today we would call gold. These races of beings known as the Atlanteans and Anunnaki were not three-dimensional. They didn't possess bodies as we think of them today. Their existence was contained in a different range of frequencies, what we would call higher dimensional frequencies. Why did they want gold? The Anunnaki required it. The exact reason is unknown, but it had something to do with the way that gold modulated the frequency of their body. Gold was an essence to their race. It held a property that was vital to their survival. The record is a little vague as to exactly why it was so important. But these records mention that their entire planet had 12 major cities and all of them were made of a semi-transparent gold. Even the Book of Revelations refers to this. Who are these beings? I mean, I've heard of the Atlanteans, but never the Anunnaki. They're a race of trans-dimensional beings. The Atlanteans were the only race of beings on Earth at that time, and they, the Anunnaki, sought permission to set up mining on Earth, which the Atlanteans agreed to. The ancient Arrow site is known within the Wingmaker's materials as the extraterrestrial time capsule that was discovered in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. Why? They didn't see any harm in helping the Anunnaki. They weren't a competitor, because the Atlanteans were more numerous. The Atlanteans wanted to have an agreement with the Anunnaki, if only to befriend them for their technology. Also, the gold mining was in an area of Earth that was of little consequence to them. I don't see how this relates to the Grand Portal. It's a long story, and we just started, but I promise I'll come to that in a bit. Okay, that's fine. I'll be patient. The Earth began to materialize more and more. It began to harden in a sense. The gold with it. The Earth, and everything on it, was solidifying. The mining of the gold would soon become impossible for the Anunnaki because they'd be unable to mine the gold if it were in a dense, physical state. Why not? Their bodies were etheric. They could not mine the gold if it was physical. They needed to have bodies that would be able to operate on Earth and mine the gold. How quickly did this happen? I don't know. 
Our records don't stipulate the time scale, but I assume it was over tens of thousands of years. The point is that they needed to create a physical vessel like an astronaut would require a spacesuit to inhabit space. They tried hundreds of experiments and had the help of both the Atlanteans and Syrians. I assume this vessel is the human body? Yes, we call them physical uniforms sometimes. The wing makers refer to them as human instruments. So the Anunnaki created a physical body to mine gold. You mean like a robot or are you saying these were humans? No. These were the equivalent of eight men. They were pre-human by a long shot. But they were our predecessors. We sometimes refer to them as human 1.0. But were they robots or biological? They were completely biological, but human 1.0s were not fully physical. They were partly etheric. You see, the Anunnaki and Syrians designed them to synchronize with the evolving densification of the Earth. So as the Earth solidified, so did the human instruments. If they were biological, did they have a soul? We wouldn't call them human if they did that. Remember I mentioned the Atlanteans? Yes. The Anunnaki and Syrians placed them, the Atlanteans, inside these human uniforms. These were very advanced beings, but apparently naive. They wanted to be in these, ape men bodies and mine gold? No, that was not their interest at all. In fact, they allowed the Anunnaki to mine their gold, but as the Earth began to solidify, they told them that if they could engineer a vessel to enable them to continue to mine their gold, that would be acceptable, but on a small scale. The Anunnaki had some kind of a falling out with the Atlanteans, and began to conspire with the Syrians and another race referred to as the Serpents. Each of these three races was interested in figuring out how to embody physical planets. They saw Earth as a laboratory of sorts to figure it out. The Anunnaki already had a human uniform. They simply needed to power it with a life source or soul. The bigger issue was how to get the Atlanteans into these embodiments, and keep them there. In effect, these three races conspired to enslave the Atlanteans within these pre-human vessels. The Atlanteans were the power generators, that made these biological entities operate. Are you saying these primitive ape men had powerful souls inside them? I don't understand how that'd be possible. It's a very complicated subject. The wing makers wrote about the implantation of programs, inside the human uniform, even version 1.0. The Syrians were mostly credited with this invention, but it was the offspring of Anu, that really perfected these implants, by programming them. The human uniform, version 1.0, was designed by the Anunnaki, the implants were designed by the Syrians, and the programming of the implants was designed, and evolved, by a being known as Marduk. Anu was the leader of the Anunnaki. He was known as the Sky God, in Mesopotamian times. The Anunnaki were the deities, written about on the Sumerian text, known as the Royal Blood. That doesn't answer my question, as to how a powerful soul would suddenly be plugged into an ape-man vessel and behave like, like a Neanderthal. Well, first, these were much more primitive than Neanderthals. But the answer is in the implants. You see, the biological entity or ape-man, as we're referring to it, was not able to operate in the physical world. They needed survival skills, how to eat, how to hunt, how to clean themselves, how to even move their bodies. All of these very fundamental functions, were necessary to actually include or program into the vessel, which was the purpose of the functional implants. The implants were akin to the brain of the human 1.0, but it wasn't just in the brain. These implants were placed inside the body within various parts, like the chest area, middle back, wrists, ankles and so forth. The primary ones were contained in the skull. But generally these implants, were networked to operate from the head, or brain area. Why do you say the head or brain area and not simply the brain? Because it wasn't in the brain. Remember, that human 1.0 was still part etheric, and part physical. The implants also needed a similar consistency or sound vibration. They were placed into the bone or skeletal structure mostly, and some in the muscle tissue. These functional implants fused into the muscles in bone, including the DNA. The wing makers put it this way. The DNA integration was for the intelligence of the plan. The muscle tissue allowed the life essence to power the functional implant. There was a central coordination point, and that was in the brain, but the implants were located throughout the body. This was an integrated system, that was installed in the human uniform, to allow it to be controlled, monitored, and programmed over time. It was the evolutionary stick and carrot. Doing it this way, 
allowed the early humans to dig out gold, which, as I said, was their primary purpose, initially. I'm sorry to sound like a broken record, but I still don't get how such an advanced race as the Atlanteans could power these ape men and become slaves. It doesn't make sense to me. You have to understand that the implanted functionality was partly to make the human 1.0 and its power source, the life essence of an Atlantean, to function efficiently and effectively as miners. That was the prime goal. The second, however, was to suppress the power source, or in this case, the Atlantean beings inside the human vessels. They did this by making the power source ignorant of its origin, and the reality of its true expression, as an infinite being. When the Atlantean beings were placed inside the human uniform, they were essentially 100% focused on physical survival, and functional performance. There were no relationships. No marriage. No reproduction. These were essentially cloned beings. They were all the same in terms of their appearance and abilities. Human drones, piloted by implanted functionality, that the Atlantean beings inside became associated with, as them. The infinite inside the body, believed it was the body and the implanted functionality, and nothing more. What happened when they died? Let me be clear, these beings, the Atlanteans, were infinite, meaning they did not have space-time regulation. They lived after the body died. However, the Anunnaki created a set of planes, or dimensions of experience, that was the equivalent of a holding plane, that's what the wing makers called it, where they could be recycled. Recycled, as in reincarnation? Yes, later on this became the basis of reincarnation. It allowed the Anunnaki to recycle the Atlanteans. Some aspects of the implanted functionality were interdimensional, which is to say, it could assist in the delivery of the beings to the proper location within the holding planes of consciousness, and assist in their reincarnation back into a new vessel. But you said that they, the ape men didn't have reproduction? Not in version 1.0. These were very basic. But the Anunnaki could create them in large scale, so when one human uniform expired, let's say they had a mining accident, another would be made. These were clones. The ability to self-reproduce came in version 2.0. That was mostly because the amount of effort required to manage this process was enormous on the part of the Anunnaki. They wanted to create an automated system, something that wouldn't require them to orchestrate all of the variables. So the Syrians helped them to create the implants that could propagate through reproduction. This enabled automation of the recycling of the beings from the holding planes to be born into the physical dimension through a baby. So, this was all automated by programming technology? I don't know, this is too weird. The universe is made up of dimensions that are a result of mathematical equations. It is constructed from mathematics. Some beings understand how to apply mathematical equations to organize and plan space-time. It's all created. This world is created, it's not real. It's a programmed reality. When I say plan, it can also be construed as control of space-time. That is to say, this is a programmed space-time reality. Once you can program space-time reality within a species like humanity, you can program at the individual level of a person, right down to when they itch their nose, if you want to. It's all mathematical equations. I don't know what to say, for now, I'll go along with you, but it really sounds like fiction to me. So, what happened to the ape men? I mentioned Marduk. He was intimately involved in the evolution of the species. That was his role. Of all the Anunnaki. He was the closest to the human 1.0s. He understood them and even admired certain aspects of them. Unconsciously, perhaps, he began to alter their program so the human 1.0s behaved more like the Anunnaki. As they began to take on the characteristics of the Anunnaki, Anu and his sons, Enki and Enlil, were concerned by this. Marduk was programming emotions and feelings. He was evolving humans too quickly, but remember, this was the evolution of the functional implants the interface between the power source, Atlanteans, and the human physical body. So it was the interface that was being evolved, which enabled the human body to show emotion, to communicate, to sense more of the three-dimensional world called Earth, etc. The other thing that was happening was that as the Earth continued to become more of a three-dimensional solid, so did the human 1.0s and their functionality implants. This growing densification also made it easier to control and suppress the Atlantean power source inside the human uniforms. It was like a compression was taking place in the this earth plane, and it was deepening the gravity of focus on earth plane survival. I wrote down the word serpents. 
Are you talking about literal serpents? No. Serpents as a race of beings. They simply were another race of beings based on reptilian DNA, but distinct from the Anunnaki. You could say they were related. They were known as life carriers. They seeded planets. They built food chains. You could say they were the grocers of the planet. But they didn't get involved in the creation of the human 1.0? Not in the technical sense. Their job was more to provide food and sustenance for it. Understand how the Atlanteans were suppressed in the human 1.0 because of the implants, but why did they go there? If they didn't volunteer as you suggest, how did they get forced into slavery when they were previously these powerful, sovereign beings? We don't know exactly how it happened. The record we read was not specific on this topic. But the tone, or word that was used, was that the Atlanteans were naive. They had no reason to think it would be possible to become enslaved. It would be like a concept that was never used in their culture. No one ever did that nor could they. You could enslave an infinite being, unless, of course, you locked them into a human uniform. And that was the cunning of the Anunnaki and their Syrian partners. They launched this attack from such a bizarre angle, that the Atlanteans couldn't see it coming. I think it was an ambush or surprise attack. You said earlier that the human 2.0 could reproduce. How long of a time existed between 1.0 and 2.0, and what were their primary differences? Human 1.0 rose to a pretty high level in terms of being able to speak or communicate. That was the major add-on that Marduk brought to human 1.0. However, the psychological state of being a clone was too hard for human 1.0. They all looked alike and had the same thoughts, so communication was helpful to a point, for example, coordinating a task, but actually having individual ideas no. And this led to depression and psychological states where, according to the wing makers, they literally went mad. This flaw was a huge problem. Anu decided to wipe them out, and this is the story of the Great Flood. Marduk managed to save some of the human 1.0s from the flood along with other flora and fauna, but it was the end of human 1.0. Human 2.0 was then created. This was the stage where the humans could self-reproduce. And when this happened, some of the Anunnaki impregnated female humans and brought in their bloodlines to the human species. This began the variations. This began the idea that humans were no longer clones. The concern, however, was that human 2.0s might become too powerful and self-aware. What if the Atlantean power source became aware that it was an infinite being? This was when Anu decided that he should be God. Humans needed to have a lord or ruler over them so it was clear that they were inferior to an external ruler. This was a key part of their program of indoctrination. Working with Marduk and the Syrians, they created the environment of Eden and created the paradigm of Eve as the instigator of the fall of humanity. This was, you might say, Act 1 of Anu as God. It was staged to provide the human 2.0s with a clear sense of an external authority, and that they were expelled from paradise because they tried to be self-realized. It was like rebuking humanity with the fist of an angry creator who wanted his creation to remain identified with their human uniform. Kind of like saying, do not think for a moment that you can be like me. And the wingmakers wrote that this actually happened kind of like the Bible said? Yes. So the God of the Bible is this Anunnaki Lord, called on you? Yes. Why are you telling me this all now? It seems like this information changes some of the previous information you've shared. To really understand the Grand Portal, you have to understand this evolutionary process, and the only way you can understand it is to go back to the beginning of the human race. So why did Anu want to be God? Remember that the original goal was the acquisition of gold. But when the Atlanteans rejected Anu, he began to conspire with the Syrians. It was just before the flood that Anu discovered that the gold he'd mined was sufficient. He didn't require more. However, the notion of being a god over the Atlanteans was seductive. The Syrians and serpents felt that the idea of enslaving infinite beings and planet ecosystems was their invention. They had something that was totally unique. They were creator gods, and every other race could be ensnared in a similar type of vessel. They began to do just that. You mean enslave other races? Yes. You see the Earth had a unique quality to its core. This core was of extreme interest to the Anunnaki when they first visited Earth. It was this core that created the gravitational field that enabled the planet to become fully physical in such a way that it could support physical life. Of course other conditions needed to be present, too, but it was this core that was the real key. Working with the Syrians and serpents, they began to do the same enslavement on other planets. They replicated the core of Earth and engineered a method for implanting this core on other planets. They were essentially terraforming a planet by cloning and installing Earth's core. So I guess the real question is, if you believe this, what are humans today? Are we simply more of the same? 
Are we human 2.0? When I said the human uniform evolves, it does, but this evolution is on a track, a pre-programmed track. The intent was to have Anu return on a cloud, the whole second coming was going to be the stage entrance for Anu. Humanity would evolve in such a way that his re-entry into our consciousness would be understood to be a good thing. Humanity's salvation. We would all be his children, and the glory of God would be upon the earth. That was the plan. From before the time of Jesus, that was the plan. Marduk programmed the entire... How long can these beings live? Again, the beings like Marduk or Enki or Anu are not based in space-time. They are infinite beings, meaning they have no end. They don't have an age. Neither do we. I'm trying to wrap my mind around all of this, but I'm finding it very hard to believe that human beings are simply uniforms for a programmed existence. Let me go back to your previous question about what humanity is now. The functional implants of the human interface are perfectly integrated within the human vessel. They operate seamlessly. So seamlessly, we do not know that they are not us. We have no choice in the way. We think our thoughts and emotions are us, that this space-time is what our thoughts and emotions exist in. Even the thought of the God, Heaven, Hell, Soul, Masters, all of these things, they are part of the program. It is integrated in both the dimension of the Earth plane and the afterlife. The afterlife is part of a deception. Tell me more about this interface and its functional implants. The eye brain was the key element that the Anunnaki needed to design to make the functional implants operate. This is in Human 1.0. In Human 2.0 it was the DNA. Once this was achieved, the Syrians could design the consciousness framework, the human consciousness. Human consciousness is the key to suppressing an infinite being. Human consciousness, or the triad of consciousness, is composed of three interactive layers. The first layer is universal mind or unconscious, and this forms the link between the individual human and the entire species. This layer is what enables all of us to see what everyone sees, feel what everyone else feels, know what everyone else knows. It is the perfect way to unify a species in separation. In fact, that is the way we feel unification, through the unconscious mind. The next layer of consciousness is the genetic mind, as the wing makers refer to it, or subconscious, in the case of Sigmund Freud. This forms the link between the individual and their family tree or genetics. This is where bloodlines are expressed. And then there is the conscious mind. This is the unique individual perception and expression, what most of us call our personality and character, which is built on this layer. The conscious mind of the individual is heavily influenced by the genetic mind, especially between birth and the age of seven or eight. By that time the influence is all-encompassing. Remember that the Anunnaki created the biological form, the body, the Syrians created the functional implants, and Marduk executed the programming of these functional implants so they would evolve along a program path, leading to the return of Anu. This was expressed in the hierarchical structure of humanity that speaks of God and Masters in religious and esoteric texts. This was all part of the design to create various religions and esoteric cults that would support a vast hierarchy and order the human species into master-student relationships, and then create a multi-leveled afterlife that would reward those who believed and were obedient to their god or masters. You see, the whole principle that was behind this entire endeavor could be summed up in one word, separation. Everything exists in separation, within the earth plane and its afterlife planes as well. But, according to the wing makers, what is real is that we are all imbued with equality and oneness, not through the unconscious mind, which only links us in separation, but rather through the life essence that is us. And this life essence is sovereign and integral. It is I am we are. No one is above, no one is below. No one is better, no one is lesser. But you're saying everything is a lie? Everything I mean everything we've been taught to believe in is a deception. How is that possible, or, or even believable? It's possible because the beings that have enslaved humanity designed a world, to which we adjusted over eons of time. We evolved into it in such a manner that we became lost in our world. The veils that have been placed over us are opaque. So much so that people operate as human uniforms unaware that everything around them is illusory. It is a programmed reality that is not real. The wing makers say everything is simply sound holographically organized to look real. It's depressing. Only when you consider the scope of the deception and the way in which humanity has allowed it to rule their behaviors. The good news is that you're hearing about this now. It doesn't feel like good news. Each person can step out of the illusion. There is no master here. 
No God is going to come down and make it happen for us. No ETs. No one. It is each of us. This is what is meant by I am. I, it's like one. One, me, and one, all of us unified. M, meaning exists now. In this moment. Not in history or memory. Not in some future time or goal. Now. It doesn't feel real to me. I was raised a Christian. I have no reason to believe that Jesus was an inside agent for this plan of deception. I'm not saying he was. Many of those who have come to earth as human teachers have tried to reveal how deep and broad and high this illusion has been made. It is as far as the edge of the universe and as close as your DNA. Everywhere in between is illusion. Jesus came to reveal much of this, but the writers of the Bible decided what would be acceptable within the paradigm of life as we humanly know it. They elected to make Jesus a part of the deception. They saw it was time for a redefinition of God to accommodate an evolving human 2.0. God was suddenly a loving father, and all of humanity was brother and sister. So you're saying Jesus was aware of this deception, but his words weren't included in the Bible? Our opinion was that his words were so against the conditioned beliefs that people could not understand them as he said them. And so, over time, they were translated into the form you know them today. The biblical translation simply lacked the original potency with which he said them. Besides, there are two methods that can make exposing this illusion a very difficult proposition. What do you mean? The first is that the unconscious mind system is inside everyone. It's like a field of information that everyone can access. It can affect or infect everyone. A revelatory idea can be passed to a small number of people, but it lacks sufficient influence to generate mass awakening. So there's unconscious mind inertia. The other, and this is more pernicious, is that the functional implants are programmed, and like any program, they can be upgraded or even turned off. As I listen to this story, I, I feel a little overwhelmed at how to proceed with the interview. I'm not sure what to ask or what direction to take things. If I look at my notes, I see my handwritten note, there is no God, is this really what you're saying? The wing makers refer to the triad of consciousness as having the God consciousness installed within it in the unconscious mind layer. But they also report that as the individual develops from about the age of six or seven, they begin to assemble their individual personality from the elements of the subconscious layer. By the time they're 12 to 14 years old, they have their unique personality well in place. For some, this uniqueness is shutting out the existence of a god. From Anu's perspective, this is fine. He probably likes having atheists and agnostics. It's more separation. More diversity. In fact, the greater the diversity in the human family, the greater the separation. The greater the separation, the easier it is to keep the program of enslavement intact. Choose sides and disagree with your opponents. Compete. It fuels wars and social unrest. As for the existence of God, we, collectively, are the closest thing to God. We are. That's the clear message of the wing makers. There is a first source, the creator of the life essence, a center point in existence that created the framework of existence through sound. But what about the ones who are enlightened or spiritual masters? They're all made up. No, it's not that they're made up. They exist. It's just that their existence is within the human interface or functional implants. They exist there. We, us, the being that is I am, that being is not of that reality. It doesn't really exist inside the holographic stage that was created by interdimensional beings millions of years ago. Rather, it is being used as a power source that animates the human interface or uniform. Over time, we've spiraled deeper and deeper inside of this created world, complete with its afterlife and different planes of existence. You could look at it this way, Anu installed a program inside the human 2.0 and in this program, humans would evolve from knowing absolutely nothing about their world to knowing God. Humans were designed to have God consciousness, meaning, to have the same understanding and awareness as Anu. But then Anu took this evolutionary line and positioned God consciousness so far out into the future that humans would essentially be chasing this God consciousness forever. They'd be chasing shadows, because until they awaken from the deception, the only God that exists in that world is Anu. Once awakened as I am, we are, or the sovereign integral, a human being lives as an expression of this consciousness. According to the wing makers, no one has achieved this at this time. It is, 
However, our future to live in this consciousness in a human instrument. No one has done this, you mean anywhere? On this plane, Earth, no one has done this. But remember, the wing makers are human in the future time. They have returned to our time to crack the shell open a bit. They have traveled to our time to remind us of what they discovered. They left this enslavement, so we will do it. But you already said that space-time is an illusion. That's true. It is, but it's hard to imagine that the universe in which we exist is really a hologram projection that was programmed inside our unconscious mind, and we're really inside this hologram, wearing a human uniform that was outfitted to perceive only this hologram. The wing makers say that the real world is sound. Everything is sound and resonance of sound. Everything we have in our human uniform for sensing our universe is millions of years of evolutionary design to tune into that hologram and only that hologram. How does that hologram extend beyond this physical world then? You said even the afterlife is part of it. There are many aspects to the afterlife. There is God, first and foremost. There is the light of illumination. There is the universal spirit and individual soul. There is a hierarchy of angels and masters. There is the concept of karma and reincarnation, or sin and salvation. The concept of heaven and hell. The concept of the chosen. The concept of an ascension path. The concept of the book of records or Akashic records. All of these concepts were designed into an upgrade of the human 2.0 interface. Certain human beings are programmed to find these concepts in their unconscious mind layer, and share them. As a result, religions sprout. Philosophies rise sometimes in support of the religions, sometimes in contradiction. Esoteric cults rise. All the while the human being remains lost. It remains muddled in its illusion. Everything tied to an empty promise in a belief, and in all those beliefs, one thing remains constant, separation. The program is vast in its reach, and the Anunnaki, once they had mined sufficient gold, had an entire race of beings enslaved. Anu, along with his allies, in the Syrian and Serpent races, decided it would be best to turn the human 2.0s into a worthless creature that forever sought enlightenment through belief. And who do you suppose would provide the things to believe in? Anu and Marduk. Everything became learning lessons. The Earth was a schoolhouse. If you learn your lessons, you won't have to keep incarnating. Learn, learn, learn. But what are you learning? You're learning to believe in the afterlife as it was described and prescribed by Anu and his designers. You are learning to don your human uniform obediently. You are learning to discern how humanity is different. You are learning to link every self-image you have to the world of three dimensions, while hoping there is more after death. The sober reality is that after you die, the being inside you is met by a guardian who will take you to your destination, based mostly on your deeds in this life. However, most beings are taken to a life review where you face your life in every detail, and based on that experience and authority the figure will prescribe your next life options for reincarnation. You are essentially recycled into the same program with a new mother and family, and the programmed life path is laid out for you to follow. The afterlife program and process is all part of the master program to retain the enslavement of the beings. Remember, we're interdimensional beings, meaning we exist in 3D in the higher planes. It's just that these higher planes are designed by the Anunnaki. They are not of the real dimensional planes. Otherwise, we would die, discover who we really are, and we would never reincarnate, or if we did, we would tell everyone on Earth that this is all an illusion. Why? Why do it this way? It doesn't make sense. What began as an experiment, in three-dimensional exploration, from a higher dimensional reality, became what is here. Every human being will confront this reality eventually. It cannot be avoided. We can agonize about the lack of fairness or ask why, but whether it makes sense to you doesn't change the fact that we live in a world of design separation. Divide and conquer. The wing makers write of the tone vibration of equality. One second, I have the papers. Here's the exact choice of words by the wing makers. When all manifestations of life are genuinely perceived as fragmentary expressions of first source, the vibration of equality, that underlies all life forms, becomes perceptible to the human instrument. Life initially emerges as an extension of source reality, and then, as an individuated energy frequency, invested within a form. It vibrates, in its pure, timeless state, 
precisely the same for all manifestations of life. This is the common ground that all life shares. This is the tone vibration of equality that can be observed within all life forms, that unifies all expressions of diversity, to the foundation of existence known as first source. It's so abstract. How does it help? Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. But the thing is, to change, to step out of this illusion, it requires each of us to wake up and stay awake. It's not reading words that will change this. It's the profound nature of new behaviors, because these behaviors signal that our consciousness layers are understood as separate from who we really are. We have to operate as I am, we are. Where does the Incunabula or Illuminati belong in this narrative? In the triad of power, the Incunabula is the capstone, also known as the capstone of the elite. I'll answer that later. I want to continue the story a little further. Okay. Human 2.0s and Earth continue to densify. We become increasingly three-dimensional. We are actually denser now than we have ever been, in terms of physicality. There was a time, about 40 years ago, when we thought alien races were actually leaving spaceships behind on purpose, but what we discovered, more recently, is that most of the aliens were not physical beings. They were observing Earth and their spaceships actually became entrained by the gravitational circuits of the Earth's core, which caused their spaceships to materialize in three-dimensional space. Because many of the materials used in the ship's construction had chemical properties, they were prone to densification when exposed to Earth's atmosphere. You mentioned the Earth's core as being the cause of all of this. What's so special about it? The magnetic fields associated with Earth's core are unique. They are, in the words of the wing makers, alive. We can only assume that alive is an aspect of intelligence. The point in this, however, is that everything's densifying. It is compressing. It is compressing for a reason. The old systems can fall in unison when density reaches a certain critical mass. And that is what will happen. When? All I can say is that it is soon. I don't want dates and times associated with it. But do you know? We know a range. More than 10 years? Yes. More than 20 years? All I will say is that the wing maker's term for this is SIN, or the Sovereign Integral Network. SIN is the definition of the new system. They said it can come in an instant once the right conditions are in place. What is unclear is how SIN develops after the grand portal of Human 3.0. That's the first time you've mentioned Human 3.0. What is it? If human beings are trapped in a prism of illusion, as human 2.0s, and their interface to the holographic universe is the reason for their being trapped, then a new model needs to step forward. Human 3.0 is this new model. It is the formula of self-realization. It is stepping out of the constructed universe or reality, and living as a self-expression of I am, we are. Human 3.0 is the sovereign integral. I call it human 3.0 SI. You see, the Grand Portal is a way to synchronize humanity to a new inception point where it is living in the expression of oneness and equality, sovereign and integral, I am and we are. It is a way for humanity to move from separation, which was its previous inception point, the one that generated Human 1.0 and 2.0. Human 3.0 SI will have a new inception point, and the reason for the Grand Portal was to enable synchronization, because how can you have a network of equality and oneness if the beings were not synchronized? What is soul, then? Soul is an idea or paradigm that has become part of the human reality program. Soul is the part of you that contains all memory of your existence as a human 1.0 and 2.0. For most of us, this is a vast repository, far too large for the consciousness framework to deal with. So the soul holds this information for each individual being. Soul is a paradigm of infinite expression within a finite reality. But you can't be infinite in a finite reality, if that reality is a programmed reality. So soul is not the life force that powers the human consciousness. That is the sovereign integral. That is what each of us is when we are stripped naked of all illusion, of all deceptions, of all limitations, of all veils, of all functional implants, including the soul. It is the redefinition of human identity and expression as I am, we are. From a human perspective, the wing makers do not see humans as lesser entities, but simply beings with inception points that enslave them. It is not a judgment that humans are worthless or bad or sinful or weak or needy. None of those things. Humanity needs a new start. A point in which they can synchronize in one realization, and that is the expression of I am, we are. 
living those words as behavior. Where is the creator of Anu the real God? How can we be allowed to live and operate in this kind of deception? The wing makers talk about the transformation mastership model. Hold on. I have the page here. This is how they put it. The time has come to integrate the dominant model of the hierarchy evolution saviorship with the dominant model of source intelligence transformation mastership. This integration can only be achieved at the level of the entity. It cannot occur within the context of a human instrument or an aspect of the hierarchy. Only the entity, the wholeness of interdimensional sovereignty imbued with source intelligence, can facilitate and fully experience the integration of these two models of existence. So what does that have to do with my question? Each individual being is responsible for this. God or source intelligence isn't going to come down from the heavens and correct human faults or obstacles. Humans need to take responsibility for this. But seriously, how? We're wrapped in so many layers of deception. It's not easy. The wing makers write about the hard virtues as the behavioral construct for this time, and how these words can be applied and lived, not simply held in the head as a worthy concept. I don't think you've mentioned these before. What are they? Appreciation or gratitude, compassion, humility, forgiveness, understanding and valor or courage. It is the combination of nowness, being in the now, and applying these words in our behaviors. It's being impeccable in this practice. What happens if you do? The unconscious mind is a doorway into all beings. These behaviors go out to all beings. They support the building of the sovereign integral network, Human 3.0, which is the replacement of separation consciousness of Human 2.0. So this is the application of insertive behavior, which is to say, I will insert these behaviors in my nonus. They will become the palette of my behavioral choice. The other half of this equation is the resistive behaviors, and these are withdrawing and stopping behaviors that support separation and deception. These are active resistances. Saying no to behaviors of your own and others, without judgment. Again, whether you operate in the insertive or resistive behavioral mode, you are affecting the whole. You either support oneness and equality, the I am, we are, or you support separation and deception, also known in our reality, as the status quo. The starting point of behavior or expression is in the now. This is the creative nerve center. Every single now, is a potential to support oneness and equality in this world, and help birth the human 3.0, and the sovereign integral network. How long? I mean, how long will this take? The grand portal enables the sovereign integral network. The wing makers suggest that around 2080, conditions should be ideal for this human 3.0 to reveal itself. But they also stipulate that it could happen sooner or later. Why wouldn't Anu, since he's God, simply stop it? Or, if Marta could program with such amazing accuracy, how could human 3.0 even come about? Unless he wanted it. There have been several interventions. While Anu and his Syrian cohorts were focused on the human 1.0 and 2.0 uniforms, they didn't pay as much attention to the interaction of Earth and the human vessel. Earth is an anomaly in itself. Remember that the Earth's gravitational fields interact with all life. Even non-physical beings, if they get close enough, and stay long enough, can be materialized in this plane of existence. Anu did not want to be materialized in this dimension, and he could only appear on this plane of existence for short times, maybe a day or two. In this time, our time, right now, the Anunnaki cannot enter this plane. They're locked out. The Earth plane is too dense. So that is one reason. Anu's ability to interact directly with his creation has been curtailed. The second intervention point is that non-physical beings have woken up to this issue of enslavement. They see how it affects everyone. It was permitted in part, because the Anunnaki and their alliance partners were strong and threatening to many other races and beings. However, this notion of enslaving infinite beings, as a concept or inception point, was infecting all of existence. It was a fear-based, separation-based idea that beings eventually began to see as a degenerative force to existence. The native state of existence, which includes space-time and non-space-time expressions, is oneness and equality. Obviously, enslavement is only possible in a separation-based paradigm. The third intervention point is the wing makers. They were the part of humanity also known as the Atlanteans, but even before the Atlantean race, they existed in a pure state genetic template, and eventually these genetics were used by Anu to create, in part, 
the Human 1.0 and Human 2.0. Although with the 2.0 version, it was less pure, because Anunnaki and Syrian genetics were introduced, among others. But the point I am trying to make here, is that the wing makers, as a future expression of Human 3.0, have entered our space-time, and have begun to crack open this prison reality. The fourth intervention point is each of us, practicing the sovereign integral process. I presume the Incunabola and Illuminati have something to say about this whole Human 3.0 plan. Am I right on that? Yes. Yes. The Triad of Power, however you want to define it, in terms of titles is programmed to create their own Human 3.0. This version will be predicated on the convergence of technology, in support of biological enhancements, that make the human vessel even more of a welcoming environment for the functional implants. The goal is to make an infinite human on the Earth plane. Infinite by virtue of immortality. The fusion of human and technology or what some call transhumanism, is the goal. So, Human 3.0 for the Triad of Power is very different from Human 3.0 SI, as envisioned by the Wing Makers. You see, transhumanism is separation. It says we are frail, weak, finite, brutish, diseased incomplete. All of these ideas for technological implants and cognitive enhancement were parts of the Advanced Contact Intelligence Organization, ACIO agenda. The ACIO was building Human 3.0? Yes certain key aspects of the transhumanist model. Not the SI version. You see, the whole idea of transcending, is linked to the inception point of separation. It is the I am supreme model. It says, the human vessel can be, and should be, enhanced in such a way that the functional implants can live forever. There are several things missing, according to the wing makers. 1. The unconscious mind cannot contain the data streams of a continuous species, and 2. The search for who we are, as the true source of life, will only be further obscured by technological enhancement. The realization of I am, we are, is not a technological realization, nor is its manifestation accelerated, by, or through technology, at an individual level. It is a self-learning and behavioral process. Nothing more, nothing less. So transhumanists want to transcend human suffering, ignorance, and mortality through technology, and the ACIO was providing some of the technology to do this, but who would have access to the technology? The elite, of course. It would only accelerate and accentuate the separation. It is simultaneous empowerment and disempowerment. The economic models for the transhumanist diffusion, as it was called in the labyrinth group, were not widely considered. The incunable being the only exception. You mean they actually wanted to build a plan that made the transcending technologies available to everyone? They looked at it from two angles. One, if the technology could be introduced at birth, it would mitigate the cost issues of healthcare and education, offsetting diffusion costs. But it would have to be a government implemented service. No private company could secure sufficient trust. So a critical component was to make the United Nations the credible world organization that could introduce transhumanism to the global stage. The second angle, was to allow class distinctions and free markets, to eventually make the technology irresistible to everyone, and then allow government subsidies to bring down the cost sufficiently to enable its dispersion. All of this sounds very altruistic, but the quality of the technologies would be variant. Elite classes would be able to secure higher quality implantations coupled to more responsive genetics. This would simply be a human civilization, that would be attempting to purge discontent and disobedience, in favor of participation in a ruled system of government, by elite transhumans. Technology will evolve from external impersonal, to external personal, to integrated personal, to internal personal. Transhumanism is the last phase, and it is the phase that the elite are moving to. The internal personal is based on exactly the same paradigm of what is now the human condition, namely, Humans have a programmed interface that's integral to their human body, and is powered by the infinite source of which they truly are. Humans are unwittingly trying to be unknown to themselves. It's part of the program, according to the wing makers. Humanity will play God to itself. It will try to engineer a better human and a better civilization. It will do this because it can imagine how humanity can save itself through simple behaviors, and the realization that these behaviors can make. They will do it because they are programmed to become integrated with technology. This is the path that the wing makers seek to avert. 
They write that human beings are complete if they can step out of their consciousness frameworks and realize what is actually powering their systems, their artificial realities, their programmed existence. The integration of technology internally will only make this realization more difficult. I think you said on Saturday that there were prophecies of a synthetic race overtaking humanity. This sounds like what those prophets saw. Fifteen felt the same way. Fifteen is the genius leader of the Advanced Contact Intelligence Organization ACIO in the Labyrinth Group. He never assumed that they were off-planet aliens. These prophets could have seen human 3.0 transhumanists in some distant timeline and assumed they were alien. What about the military force? As you can imagine, this is where it will be tested first. There is a whole field of psychological technology that has laid the groundwork for the real internal technologies to flow into the military. It will be released there initially, so it can be properly defended for testing purposes. Once it's proven there, it will converge with the integrated personal technology programs of the corporate elite. When you say integrated personal, what do you mean exactly? Miniaturization of the technology will enable it to adorn the body. It will not be internal yet, but it is part of the human body, like clothing, glasses, watches, and jewelry. Bear with me, but let me see if I have this straight. Human 1.0 was a creation of a godlike being. No. Anu is the same as us, or the Atlanteans. He was no more intelligent or godlike. He was deceptive. That is the only distinction. Okay, but Anu created human 1.0, and then found them to be too similar to his own capabilities, and feared they would one day figure out that they were Atlanteans, enslaved by the Anunnaki. And he was worried about the consequences of that discovery. So, he wiped them clean with the planetary flood. According to the wing makers, the flood was one part of the extinction program. But there were also nuclear weapons that were discharged on the planet, most of which have been explained away as meteorite impacts. But the wing makers write that these were advanced weapons used against human populations that had avoided the flood. Okay. In whatever way human 1.0s were eliminated from the planet, they were replaced by human 2.0, and these included upgrades like self-reproduction and more advanced programming. And central to this programming was the notion that Anu was God, and would return to his creation. Correct? Yes. And the next upgrade to Human 2.0 branches out like a fork in the road. One version of Human 3.0 goes down the path of technology integration, or transhumanism. The other version, 3.0 SI, is a more organic process of using behaviors to support this process of becoming a human 3.0 or sovereign integral, and then becoming part of a network of these sovereign integrals. Is that correct? You have the general idea, yes. And the triad of power wants human 3.0 to go down the path of technology integration, because that is how they are programmed, to emulate their god, Anu. Right? Yes. So it's kind of like humanity sits at a crossroads. On the one side is the triad of power, that is programmed to develop human 3.0 as a, a cyborg, I guess, and the other side is the future existence of humanity urging us to do it internally, one person at a time, through a behavioral process. I guess the part that's missing for me is the role of the Grand Portal, which remains unclear. I thought it was a technology that proved the existence, the irrefutable scientific existence of the human soul. How does that figure into this? There are humans here who are designers of the new unconscious mind that will bridge human populations everywhere on the planet to feel and express equality and oneness. It will connect humanity and the I am, we are, consciousness, instead of the separation consciousness. It will not be based on hierarchy. The deception is coming down. One of the things that was never disclosed in the materials, including my previous four interviews, is that certain information was to be withheld. Some information was even veiled to not raise the ire of the triad of power. This information, this interview, will not be disclosed in the same timeline as the previous four. Why? The designers of the new unconscious layer of the human 3.0 are on the planet now. They are doing some of the preparation required to move humanity, who will be sitting at the fork in the road, in the next 40-50 years, to choose the I am, we are. Have. So I can't release this interview? No. When it's time, I will contact you. You said some of the information was veiled. In what way? The wing makers will only release some of the information now, in 1998. That is the information that will not feel too revolutionary. Too radical. 
it needed, in their own words, to cross into the human interface and activate a willingness to listen to their voice. For example, they used the term wing makers to describe themselves, knowing it would have a connection to the angel construct. But you said the wing makers were a future representation of human beings, presumably, from this disclosure, version 3.0. Right? Yes, but there is programming within the human interface, where the functional implants are networked as a system that will surmount certain information. A person will hear it, but they will not act on it. They will hear it, but they will object to it. They will hear it, but they will not share it. All of these programs were created, not originally, but they can be upgraded. The program can be updated with new instructions. It makes cracking into this reality, exposing it for what it truly is, a very difficult proposition. This is why it requires a degree of stealth. The deception is so thick and opaque in this reality, that the ones who are trying to come into the prison and create a crack in the wall, they also have to use a form of deception. Why? The programming, Sarah. If the pure state information was given out, and it contradicted everything that people have been told to believe, if it was the literal reverse of what was logical and acceptable in this world, who would listen? The wing makers needed to awaken certain people to bring them inside their information field, to warm them up to the truth. It has to be done in degrees for the vast majority of people. What about me? You are not among the vast majority, but then you're only getting a taste of it. Does everyone within the labyrinth group know this, too? Yes, to varying degrees. But they were going down the transhumanism path. Did this information change their mind? No. That's really why I'm here. You just said I'm only getting a taste of it. So there's still more materials that will be released later? Yes. But you're not going to tell me when, right? Correct. As intelligent and aware as the labyrinth group is, why didn't this information change their minds? I had the benefit of having direct interactions with the wing makers. None of my peers did. This was the difference in my willingness to act on the information, and not simply consider it as a contradiction to my invested reality. This is fucked up, isn't it? What part? All of it. It's all fucked up and we did it. Whatever it is, it's important to know what's behind the deception, to look with sober eyes on the truth. It may not be a beautiful picture to be sure, but how else do you realize your own truth, until you know the truth of the big picture? So, however screwed up it seems, it is an inception point for the individual to redefine themselves. Would you rather stay in the illusion of a soul, in a human body, that will be saved by God, ascend into heaven and hang out with angels who strum harps? That whole idea is repulsive once you know this. That picture is based on separation, selfishness, lack of empathy and understanding. Or, you can simply say it's all a big illusion, including the notion that we are infinite beings, and that when you die, you're done. The part of this new picture that is promising is that we exist infinitely, despite the fact that we have been suppressed and enslaved. We also can play a role in supporting this redefinition of the human being, through our thoughts and behaviors. And maybe most importantly, we have the wing makers, our future selves, providing us with evidence that I am, we are, prevailed. When I first read these materials, these were the things that provided some sense of hope, and I share them with you, for what it's worth. Thanks. All of the things that you told me in the first four interviews, with this new information, does it change it? Yes. Everything is affected by this. Give me an example. Sunday night I mentioned LERM or the Light Encoded Reality Matrix. LERM is what the Labyrinth Group thought was God, in terms of proof. But what was really discovered was the essence of Anu, and how he operates in this reality, as an all-encompassing observation field, that is inside our consciousness interface to this reality existence called Earth. LERM is Anu projected. What about ETs? Don't they know about this and can't they intervene and save us from this situation? Remember, everyone inside our universe is part of this deception, whether they know it or not. There are four classes of beings. 1. Those who know the deception and are actively supporting it. 2. Those who know about the deception, but are unwilling to do anything about it. 3. Those who don't know the deception and are unknowingly supporting it. And 4. Those who know about the deception and are actively trying to step out of the deception, and engineer a process for everyone else to do the same. That's it. It doesn't matter if the being is physical or non-physical. Everyone falls into one of these four categories, everywhere in our universe of existence. The beings in group 3 are waking up. Some of them understand that the deception in one part of the universe infects all. 
It requires corrective action. It requires collective understanding to ensure that it will never happen again. How can everyone in this universe be a part of this deception? I don't understand. Our entire universe is created. I'm not saying it is the universe. I'm saying that what we call the universe, as far as we can observe, is part of the hologram implanted within our consciousness framework and human interface. Our mind consciousness established the spatial temporal relationships of everything we see, and as I said, this is part of our program. And this includes the universe. Why do you think that our best minds on the planet cannot define consciousness, let alone the subconscious and unconscious mind? It is programmed this way. Anu did not want us to figure it out. We'll look at neural information and decide it can be sliced a thousand different ways, but it still doesn't explain how it's experienced. As Aristotle said some 2,300 years ago, to be conscious that we are perceiving, is to be So, are we an isolated life form that confronts our external, separate reality? No, we are connected to all. That is why I am, we are, is the critical inception point for our identity. Any being that does not confirm their belief in this, is not aware of reality. It doesn't matter where they exist or what vessel they wear. It doesn't matter if they want to save humanity. They must first act from this inception. The universe, as immense as it appears, is a hologram inside a programmed existence which every human being agrees is reality. That agreement informs the unconscious mind, again, a part of the human interface that Anu created and collectively we all see our world the same way, more or less. We have been told there are trillions of planets with life. That the universe is abundant with life forms in various dimensions, but what we notice here. On Earth. The tangible, visible Earth. Are there other beings? Of course. I've seen them. Will they save humanity? They can't. They can only support. It isn't about anyone or anything saving us. It is about a redefinition process that can only occur within each individual entity. It isn't about being beamed up or ascending to some higher, protected dimension. This will be done in the physical body as human beings, by human beings, for human beings. Why you? Why do you suppose you can interact with the Wingmakers and were asked to release this information? Why didn't they interact with 15, too? First of all, it isn't just me. However, within the Labyrinth group, they selected me for reasons that I had a certain resonance to their information that others within the Labyrinth group lacked. In terms of releasing the information, perhaps I was the only one who would go to the extreme of defecting from the ACIO, to make this information available. I don't look at myself as unique, in the sense that I am the only one involved in getting this information out. There are others, many others, both physical and non-physical, who are assisting in this transformative process. The Wingmakers refer to it in their philosophy papers as the two portals. I've only heard you speak of the Grand Portal. I assume it's one of the two portals. Yes. The Grand Portal will be released in the Wingmakers literature, as the irrefutable scientific discovery of the human soul, and in a way, that's true, but it's not the whole story. The two portals are defined as the crack, and the wall demolition. I hope you plan to explain that. Yes, well, the crack is the first portal. It is the portal between worlds. It is a human, and that's about all I know at this time. A human who does what? That can step between worlds. I realize that thousands of people, even famous people, have claimed to have visited heaven, but according to the writings of the wing makers, it is not true. They have wandered into the astral world, which has many dimensions, but this astral world is part of the creation of Anu, in terms of our programming. Our true dimensional existence is not of Anu's creation or formulas. The human portal will be a communication portal between our origins, as a race of infinite beings, and this world, the hologram of deception. What about the wall demolition, as you called it? The grand portal is the wall demolition. That's when the wall comes down, through the efforts of all beings that are undergoing the sovereign integral process. And this makes it possible for all human beings to step forward into their infinite self or life essence. So the sequence is first the human portal and then the grand portal? And from a timing perspective, what can you say about it? The human portal anchors the inception point on Earth for the grand portal. It will come in about 10 years. The grand portal, about 70 years after that. Those are the rough time frames I've been given, 
but always with a stipulation that these times can shift and change. What does science say about this? Science in terms of what? I mean the whole notion of the universe being a hologram or illusion created inside our head. Science is not able to explain it. The counter-logical nature of the universe, in terms of quantum behavior, is impossible to explain. Some scientists have relented to explaining it all the way as hidden variables. But frankly, what the wing makers have explained, is that we're creating the universe through the human interface Anu provided us, by reinterpreting sound vibrations through our five senses. But it doesn't make sense, how can I see the moon, and a two-year-old can see it exactly the same way? How can it be the same? No, this is what the unconscious mind provides the human 2.0 interface. It gathers the interpretation of the sound vibration of the moon, based on billions and billions of sightings throughout time. These evolve and change based on environmental conditions, but generally the notion that the moon is silver, and generally the size that it is, is stored and shared in the DNA and unconscious mind system, and reinforced by culture, family and education. This is the universal collective field. It's a field effect that transfers information through vibratory fields that interconnect humans. Maybe it'll just take me a while to get that one. I hear your explanation. It just doesn't make sense to me. Let me change the topic slightly. If everyone's life is pre-programmed, why are you and I talking about this? I mean why are we able to discuss this? Why would Marduk's program allow us to even glimpse this information? It's a good question. Maybe the best way to understand this is to consider a thought experiment. Imagine that our universe is a bubble. It was created by a group of entities that used deception against their equals, who had never experienced such an evil vision of separation, and therefore couldn't conceive of a defense against it. This double universe seemed complete and always expanding. In many ways, it was an ideal platform for life, and yet only one sentient life form seemed to exist on one tiny planet inside this vast, near infinite universe. Inside this same bubble, there were vibratory dimensions that became known in religious circles as heaven and hell, and in spiritual and psychic circles, as the etheric and astral planes. These planes exist inside the bubble, but are not visible with the human interface or five senses. We'll call this bubble one. External to bubble one, imagine there is another universe or dimension of existence. It is vast and encompasses bubble one wholly. Within the second, larger bubble is the dimension from which our life essence originated prior to its insertion into bubble one. Now, beings in bubble two can enter bubble one and experience it fully. However, if they get too close to the populated planet called Earth and stay too long, they will manifest and not be able to return to bubble two. Earth is the focal point in bubble one. The entities, who fancy themselves as gods, create more bubbles. They entrap other races in the same paradigm of deception and cast beings from bubble 2 to new bubbles that are similar to bubble 1. These entities essentially plan to take over bubble 2 for themselves, while making their equals, who formerly shared bubble 2, enslaved worshippers who look to the rulers of bubble 2 as their gods. Meanwhile, there is a larger bubble that surrounds bubble 2. We'll call it bubble 3. Are you with me? I think so. Good. So Bubble 3 encompasses Bubble 2 and all of the smaller bubbles related to Bubble 1. There are beings in Bubble 3 that are aware of the deception perpetrated on the bubbles and the beings within them, but infinite beings are patient and curious. They wanted to see what this separation construct would create. In dimensions that had only known oneness and equality, the concept of division in material form was interesting. But all the human misery, just to run an experiment? Remember the human machine is not real. It's the equivalent of a spacesuit with artificial intelligence and a sense and respond sensory system. The astronaut, us, is infinite. It cannot be killed, or hurt, or destroyed. While the experimentation looks miserable from a human perspective, it is vibrant with learning on many other levels, one of which is to build the awareness in all beings of never allowing this deception to occur again. The unconscious mind system of the human being exists in a similar, but significantly more advanced modus operandi, in the interdimensional beings that can interoperate between the three bubbles. It is what allows the equality and oneness to be maintained in vast worlds of space-time and quantum space-time. Now, within this thought experiment, you can see that the dimensions of space-time are more dimensional than one universe. That entities exist in these various bubbles, experimenting with their creation. 
Sometimes in this experimentation, they decide to enslave through the constructs of separation and deception. This occurs with issues that human beings can relate to like scarcity, preservation of a race, unintended consequences of decisions, service to self instead of service to truth. All of these elements were in the behavioral equations of Anu and his Syrian accomplices. At some point, the lessons are learned. The entire experiment solidifies, and hardens to such a degree, that it cannot really compress anymore. Its value rapidly diminishes from that point. When this happens, beings will intervene. In our case, we intervened in the form of humanity returning to warn of this reality, hence the wing maker's intervention. As for why we are talking, it's simple. Marduk is not the only one who can program. And what does that mean? In today's world we have programmers who can write code that take the user of that code from one experience to the next. It moves them from point A to point B. Programming is an aspect of time. It's a directional process. You're aware of hackers. They come in all sizes. Earlier this year a 15 year old kid hacked into the US Air Force. Even Microsoft is finding it impossible to protect its anti-operating system. The hacker mindset is again a manifestation of separation. It is a polarity. A mind game of sorts, complete with ego and sometimes greed. Mostly, it's a reminder that whatever's a fortress remains vulnerable. The program that Marduk created is similar in concept to our software programming, but infinitely more complex and advanced. However, as any hacker will tell you, anything can be hacked, with the right technology and skill. Our programs have been hacked. We've been altered. We're not connected in the same way to the grid lines that rule this hologram that I called Bubble One a little earlier. Who? Who did the hacking? I could give you a name. I don't know. I've been told that there are many resources that are being used to create the crack in the wall, and then, from the inside, that's us, humanity, we'll push the wall down collectively and walk out of this prison. We are part of the crack. I don't remember volunteering. For what it's worth, neither do I. Okay. I'm going to shift the conversation a bit. In my notes on Saturday you said the following, that the wingmakers claim that the three-dimensional five-sensory domain that humans have adjusted to, is the reason we are only using a fractional portion of our intelligence. They claim that the time capsule would be the bridge from the three-dimensional five-sensory domain, to the multidimensional seven-sensory domain. How does that relate to tonight's conversation, and what exactly is the time capsule? The time capsule is the content of the Wing Makers project. It's called the time capsule because it's a design intervention to shift time. It's called the capsule because it is a delivery system of information that is designed to assist people to unlock from their grid lines, their pre-programmed life path, where they were essentially a human robot marching through their life path as they were programmed to do. Until the wing makers disclose this aspect of their intervention, they can't disclose the real meaning behind their words. Again, they cloak their words in the accepted standards of this world's rules relative to the new age, new world order, spirituality, religion, philosophy, etc. This gave them an accepted anonymity. After all, it was all presented as a myth. There's nothing in a myth that could cause Anu to censor or strike back. They tested the explicitness of the language, and decided to place some of the activational elements in other formats like art, poetry and music. In other words, when they couldn't state something explicitly, because of retaliatory concerns, they would encode it into the art. But you've asked me to hold it back, this interview. What if it never gets released? Then it wasn't necessary. But then that would make the rest of the materials less than true, wouldn't it? I would say it would make them less direct or explicit, but to your point, yes. I would agree that the truth is diminished without the framework of this disclosure. Who are these materials for? I mean, I can tell you right now that when you were describing the first four interviews, I could count on one hand how many people I know who would listen to this perspective with an open mind. Most of my friends and family, I wouldn't even mention it. But with this interview, I don't think anyone I know would be open to it. I can't think of one, to be honest. I understand. The number of people who show up to look through the crack in the wall, will be very small. In terms of the whole population, a tiny fraction. But the real definition of the grand portal is that enough people will look through that crack and recognize there is more, much more to reality's existence, and they will work collectively to push down the wall. When the wall falls, that will be when the infinite beings inside step out and operate the human instrument, 
not as a separate thing, not as a vessel or something they wear as a uniform, but they will operate inside the human body, free of the interface and functional implants. You mean they won't ascend into bubble number two or three? They will stay right here, Earth. But they will stay here, in the body, as infinite beings, not enslaved shells of themselves. You said there were other beings involved in this intervention. Can you disclose them? I'd prefer not to say anything other than to mention that it will be disclosed soon. This whole enslavement of humanity is like the six blind men touching the elephant. Many people are feeling parts of the elephant and describing the part they are touching, but with blindfolds on, it is very hard to describe the whole deception. Are these blind men humans? Yes, of course. They see parts of this enslavement and they know something is happening. Something isn't right. You can have godlike beings walking around the earth coincident with murder, rape, child abuse and war, and they don't feel the separation and deception. Something is terribly wrong. Why are we letting this happen? According to the wing makers, there are people who are incarnated now who would be the equivalent of outliers. According to the wing makers, there are people who are incarnated now who would be the equivalent of outliers. Are you familiar with this term? No. The term is typically used in statistics. Think of it like an anomaly. A person has what is called the transient malfunction to their interface, but in this malfunction, they are able to see through the crack. It might only last a second or two, but they glimpse what is behind the walls. And again, I'm not talking about the astral plane, that's just a more rarefied plane of the hologram of deception. People with these transient malfunctions often end up being diagnosed autistic, or in extreme cases, are considered schizophrenic, but because the malfunction is transient, they slowly merge back into the human hologram and lack the contextual meaning of what they saw anyway. They learn to forget. The program draws them back in. But before they forget, before they return to normal beliefs, before they are drugged or quarantined, they share their experience to the unconscious mind. And this begins to express itself through culture. It'll come out in movies, books, theater, art, poetry, and many of these expressions will help to feed the unconscious mind and open it up to the possibility that the scale of our prison encompasses even the light, even science, even angels, even God. Do we wear a target on ourselves when this gets released? I mean will Anu decide to take us down if this goes out? Believe me. I've probed on that issue. There's risk involved. How much, I don't know. The wing makers explain that the creators of this plan have resigned themselves to the intervention, but that their equivalents here on Earth are not as excited by those prospects. It'll work its way out, but it'll take some time. What happens between now, and the Grand Portal, when the wall gets pushed down? All I can tell you is that the triad of power will continue to consolidate. The money system will continue to spiral away from the many into the hands of the few. This was part of the original programming. Relating to the return of Anu? Yes. Anu would step in and solve the world's problems and be anointed. Anu would use the centralization of the money system to integrate technology into biologic systems, so they would be able to have infinite existence in Bubble One, Earth. That way, Anu reasoned, he could be God in this world forever. But as I said, this plan was not perfect in the sense of its infinitude. Anu underestimated the beings in Bubble 3 and beyond. Has it ever been tried before? What? This crack in the wall, and then pushing the wall down? No. Not in our world. This is the first coordinated effort to liberate humanity. But what about Jesus or Buddha? According to the wing makers, each of the avatars who came to this planet did so as invited guests. An avatar is an incarnate teacher of truth. Humans were explained as lost beings. It's literally how we are defined in the planes of existence outside our planet. Remember what I had said about the higher dimensional beings that would visit Earth and become manifested? Yes. That was how many of these avatars came to Earth. They did not go through the birth process, they literally manifested in the Earth plane with their dimensional consciousness intact. They did not want to be born into this world and inhabit a human body, because they knew they would sleep and forget. Avatars had to directly manifest. The problem was that people were afraid of them and stayed away, or people acted as guardians of the old system and wanted to destroy the Avatar, or some people looked to the Avatar to save them. This was what's on the evolution saviorship model of the universe. Evolution, as defined here, 
is the process of being saved and absolved of one's sins. The sinner evolved into the disciple, and the disciple evolved into the teacher, and the teacher evolved into the hierarchy of teachers and leaders. Saviorship simply meant that an outside force or avatar would save the individual from their sins or reprehensible behavior, and connect them to the light or spirit of God. The Savior was an intermediary of the hierarchy that plugged the individual into the light of illumination and enlightenment. So, didn't these avatars open a crack? Of sorts, but mostly it was to demonstrate what was really inside the human vessel. It was not to show miracles for the sake of convincing people to follow them or to create a religion. The resurrection, for example, was not a piece of theater to underline Jesus' unique stature as the Son of God. He was not that. That was written in later. As his popularity grew, it was understood that Anu and Marduk could utilize Jesus to strengthen Anu's hold on human culture, and reposition himself as a loving God, the father of great enemies like Jesus. Avatars were generally considered an annoyance by Anu. Usually they were killed or locked up to wither and die. Stories would be created to either cement them to Anu's glorification, or they would be vilified and deemed to be of Satan. There was no middle ground with avatars. Jesus was really the first avatar that Anu decided to embrace and create a world religion around. Each of the other world religions were modeled after Christianity, even those whose founder was not technically an avatar. Avatars were very rare. They wanted to come in and push down the walls, but they needed a large enough following to bring the whole wall down. A crack wouldn't be enough. And if they came simply to show the nature of the infinite being inside each human uniform, they risked a religion being built around them that would become, over time, welded to Anu and the holographic, multi-layer deception that hung over humanity like a dome. The wing makers refer to a new type of being called the sovereign entity. These are pre-sovereign integral beings, but they are seated with the capacity to step out of the hierarchy, and in doing so, they allow themselves to examine information that others would attack or ignore. Unfortunately, the information that will liberate people is the very information they are programmed to attack. When you use the term hierarchy, what are you referring to exactly? The wing makers seem to use this interchangeably with Anu at the top, his leadership within the dimensions, or bubble two, and his leadership on earth in the form of the triad of power. Collectively, this is the hierarchy. Can you help me understand how it is that no one knows about this? I mean, out of six billion people that walk the earth now, and I don't know how many over the whole history of mankind, but it must be, I don't know, about a hundred billion or so, how could it be disguised? That's how many life expressions, perhaps, but not beings. Because of reincarnation, right? Yes. But to answer your question, it's done through the interface of the human vessel. The interface is what most people consider to be them. That is their consciousness. The interface fuses with the physical body and the dimensional being that powers and animates it. There's an old saying that the last thing a fish notices is water. It's an apt expression of our circumstance, too. Humans have been living in this consciousness of a human body ever since they were first created. It is all they have ever known, and because of the sophistication of the technology that underlies this entire deception, we are thrown distraction after distraction to never, ever consider the possibility that everything is a part of an illusion, everything. While it seems impossible that a hundred billion lives have existed and not one has peered through the crack, it would be like going to the deep sea where the bioluminescent fish live, and explaining to them that a world exists of light and warmth. Maybe one or two would venture from the depths if they were told of this world, and they would return and report that they had experienced this strange, mysterious world. But never would they imagine that a whole world of land and air existed above that, where beings of entirely different natures walked on dry dirt and breathed air and looked at stars a billion light years away. Humans are a lot like those bioluminescent fish. Okay, I understand the analogy, but no one... Momentary glimpses through cracks, that's all. The avatars that manifested here have operated the closest to our true nature on this planet, but those who have gone through the birth process and have human DNA, they are locked into their interface or they are quickly removed. Tuesday you talked at length about Lucifer and his creation of the Animus. Where's that factor into this, this story? Until last night I didn't know if this interview would even take place. I knew you wanted to speak in depth about the Grand Portal, but I wasn't sure at what level I would be allowed to disclose it. This is very guarded information. It's both a break-in and a break-out. 
The break-in is difficult to engineer amid the misinformation and deception that occurs on this planet relative to humans. Lucifer and the fallen angels was a nod to the fallen humans who were booted out of Eden. It is the same story with the same purpose, place fear of rebellion in the consciousness systems of humans. Make it strong and potent in the unconscious mind, and make sure that Lucifer, Satan and the devil mirror the trinity of good, the Father, Son and the Holy Ghost. Anu realized that the best way to make his human creation lean his way was to make the path to his kingdom appear virtuous and morally acceptable. And how do you do that? You have evil embodied in demons that are bent on enslaving humans and preventing them from following the virtuous path. It created the perfect polarity of human beings progressing to the kingdom of God, while demons seduced and ensnared them. Angels and ascended masters were guides to show the way to the waiting kingdom. Eastern traditions used demigods, hierarchies of masters, meditation, but it was based on the very same polarity, which at its most basic level was light is good, and darkness is evil. So with that said, let me return to your question about Lucifer and the Animus. The story of Lucifer is like a prop on a stage. With Lucifer in play, the stage is more dangerous. You can place blame. You can deflect blame and responsibility from the morally righteous and God-fearing humans. You can infer that your enemies are enslaved by demons that do the bidding of Lucifer or Satan. This creates conflicts that lead to wars. This creates histories of conflict which sow generation after generation of people who are living their forefathers' conflict. Amid all of this, God grows in stature and importance. Everyone wants to claim that God is on their side. Lucifer was a catalyst to enlarge the importance of Anu. To make humans dependent on him even though they never saw him, heard him, tasted him, smelled him or touched him. He was in the universal field, vis-a-vis, -vis, the unconscious mind. It was programmed this way, and religious culture only made it feel more real. The animus were the human 3.0, in the trajectory envisioned by Anu, to support his infinite supremacy over humanity. His goal was to synthesize humanity with technology. The animus were us in a potential future. There are government organizations, corporate entities and research institutions that share this same goal even as we speak. How did the decision get made not to release everything? I've said that the Wingmaker's materials are extensive. There are 24 philosophical papers, but only four will be released. The four interviews we previously done, as I told you, these four will be released, possibly not all at once, but those have been sanctioned. This interview and the remaining 20 philosophy papers will not be released until certain conditions are met. What those conditions are, I don't know. I assume it has to do with the discovery of the portal, the human portal I mentioned, and getting the crack in the wall established in this world. Once a foothold is made in establishing the inception point, perhaps then the other materials can be released. As for how the decision is made, let me be very clear that this is not my decision. It is determined by the wing makers. An intervention from time travelers is a very sensitive operation. Many variables need to be weighed and considered. Forgive my blunt question here, but how do you know that the wingmakers aren't part of this whole deception? At some point you have to trust your feelings and intuition, otherwise everything is just a purposeless mental exercise. I can say that I'm 100% confident. As a scientist, I'm disbelieving by nature, but everything I've read and studied is consistent to their stated goal, which is to establish a new inception point for human beings in this specific time. Their first disclosure is a cloaked message of hope. An energetic rewiring of the spiritual philosophies of this planet, away from masters, organizations, hierarchies and belief. It is more focused on becoming a spiritual activist or practitioner of behavioral intelligence. It is about activating pre-sovereign integrals who are able to understand the evolutionary scope of the human being and help it to veer in the direction of the sovereign integral. The next or second disclosure will be the activation of the human portal. I don't know yet how this will unfold, only that it will happen relatively soon. The third disclosure will be this interview and possibly other material. When this interview is released, it signals that the inception point has already been made. According to the wing makers, this means that the grand portal will occur on this planet. Once the new inception point is anchored, it will unfold to plan. I have made the decision that if the second disclosure occurs, I will commit to this plan 100%. Until then, I have told the wing makers that I am with them, and will conduct my actions according to their insights, 
and guidance, but I will always have doubt in my mind, until I see that the second disclosure occurs. What if no one believes this, Dr. Neruda? What if you release this interview sometime in the future, and no one can relate to it or, as you suggested, they attack it? What then? Is the human portal sufficient to make this whole thing happen? Yes. That's what I have been told. Once the inception point is anchored, it will all unfold to plan. So no one needs to believe this, it'll just happen? That doesn't sound right. This information will remain in the underground, but science, according to the wing makers, will be the force to actually prove out this information. How? Science will find the walls. They won't expose the crack or necessarily assist in the demolition, but they will expose the walls. But you said that LERM was discovered by the ACIO, and they thought of it as God or Universal Intelligence or whatever it was. Yes. I'm not saying that science will define the hologram of deception as an insidious ruse perpetrated on humanity to enslave infinite beings to operate as finite, fear-based diminishments of themselves. That's not my point. But those sovereign entities that stand around the crack in the wall will need help from legitimate sources that validate the possibility of the hologram. I don't expect science to label the hologram good or bad, or imbue it with philosophical issues like deception, polarity, separation, etc. The wing makers have explained that around the time that the human portal is activated, a scientist of great stature will emerge with a theory that will support the inception point. It is all being facilitated by their hacking, into the program of these and other individuals. Do you know the name of this scientist? No. Do you think it's you? No. I have no stature. No one has ever heard of me. The wing makers were speaking of someone who held a high degree of credibility in the scientific community. I still don't see how it will happen. I mean the wall coming down. If things are as screwed up as you say, people will follow their programming. They'll have too much fear to release everything they've learned, to be real and true. I just don't think people can make such a radical shift. I agree. They can't, not in the face of the status quo. But the status quo is part of the wall that will be taken down. You can't paper over this. You can't wave a magic wand and pretend it doesn't exist. The wars between races, religions, classes, geographies, relationships of every scope, these cannot be pardoned by a savior or ET race. They have consequences, and these have to be dealt with. The status quo. The old normalcy, the comfortable distortion, will be removed, because you cannot build a heaven on earth, as simply as plopping a new reality layer on top of the status quo. It would be like adding the Grand Canyon on top of a skyscraper. The skyscraper can't support it. The amount of change that's coming sounds overwhelming. If there's one thing I've learned in this interaction with the wing makers, there is a programming track, and then there is a super consciousness track. The latter is involved with how quantum reality membranes intersect, and can create chain reactions that ripple across every dimension. These chain reactions are guided by event strings designed by beings from very high dimensions. As I previously said, every being has the I am, sovereignty, but they also possess the we are, integration. As the I am asserts itself through the expression of behaviors, either resistive or insertive, the I am disentangles itself from the program the human 2.0 interface. It begins to reconnect with the we are frequency, or the tone of equality as the wing makers have referred to it. It broadcasts this through the unconscious mind or universal field, making it easier for another being to touch into this same perspective, and adopt these behaviors. My point is, that either the designers of the higher dimensional planes, or humanity as a collective, could potentially accelerate or decelerate the grand portal. What if there was a tug of war, like the higher beings wanted it sooner, and humanity wanted it later? I don't know. I suspect the higher dimensional beings would listen to the resistance. I really don't have an opinion on that one. One day, hopefully in the not too distant future, a person will hear this interview. What advice would you give them? Everyone has thoughts and emotions. Everyone shares a reality called Earth and the human body. We're all on the same stage, playing different roles, but the stage unifies us to some degree. 
None of us can look across the stage and see a beautiful world of peace and harmony, or goodwill to all men. It isn't the reality that encompasses us. The question is, how do we move closer to a reality that supports our most innate truth, that I am, we are? How do we create a stage and write a play that supports our transformation into the sovereign integral, that is in fact what we each are? Has religion shown the way? Has spirituality? How about science? How about our education system? Government? My point is, that nothing that is currently in play, is uniting us in equality and oneness. If you look at everything in your world, after you hear this interview, you will see that our world is designed for a very specific function, and this function is to feel separation. It can be as obvious as the color of skin, gender and different cultures, to the subtler distinctions between religions and spirituality, but the design is fractal, and it infuses everything in this world, in this common unity I have called separation. Ironically, our unity is separation. If you agree, if you also see, or sense this separation, you might also decide that it's escalating, not moving in the direction of unity, but further towards diversification and distinction, as if the more granular humanity becomes, in its information access, and expression, the more it drifts apart into clumps of similarity, that feign unity within the clump, but expresses separation to the whole. The leaders of this world, whether they come from political, economic, military, religious or cultural perspectives, know how to speak the language of unity and oneness, but their actions are the result of programs that often act in reverse. This isn't about thoughts and language. This is about behaviors and actions. People know how to disconnect from their thoughts and say one thing, and then do another. They know how to feign care, but their actions demonstrate hollowness. This is not an indictment to every standing solution, but nothing has worked. Religion's failure has birthed the nihilistic and disillusioned organizations of darkness and occult experimentation. They feed off one another. It's symbiotic survival. But what is lost in this is the reality that confusion and disaffection reaches into the world's populations, and dulls our collective minds and hearts. There is hope. Hope resides in the vacuum of unity and oneness, that is unaligned to anything on this planet. No one owns it, or controls it, or administers it. There is no mediation or a go-between. It is completely unique. For all intents and purposes, it has never been seen or heard. It is on the other side of the wall. This is our hope, as foreign and strange as it may seem. What is in this world is not working, and it is because of separation. I don't care if you read the most esoteric, spiritual information on this planet, it is of separation. I've read esoteric, spiritual documents, over the past 20 years, that would make most people swoon, and say to themselves, this is the highest information, or this information is true because it is so detailed, no one could possibly know this much detail, unless it was true. The most esoteric information on this planet was not written by human beings, but through human beings, vis-a-vis -vis channeling. The channeling speaks of wonderful spiritual realities, of how humans and aliens are one, of how the deep psychology of human beings is constructed, of the complex cosmological environment in which humanity is nested. All wonderful information except no one mentions how we are enslaved, or why, or by whom. Not one. If these wonderful sources of information knew about how humanity is enslaved, wouldn't they share it? Isn't this the most basic point of information? What the wing makers call the inception point. Why hasn't any of this esoteric literature shown this? I'll tell you, because the beings are either inside the hologram and don't realize it themselves, or are part of a deception and are regarding its discovery from humans. They're no different from us, us, as infinite beings. They're lost in this hologram of deception as much as we are. For those of you who hear this interview and are unsettled by it, I can only say, good, you should be. It's a reality check on a cosmic, universal and individual level. You can bathe in the splendor of spirituality, and quench your thirst with the presented masters, or you can deepen your understanding of the reality that confronts us, and stand up committed to apply your self-expression in service to truth. To walk your life in the expression of resistive and insertive behaviors. To be sovereign and integral. It isn't about spouting high spiritual concepts in thoughts and words. That is the reflex of the consciousness system. It's parroting and robotic. Live the I am, we are, in your behaviors, and leave the mind. Shatter it. 
The mind is programmed to compare and analyze, which feeds the media separation. Sorry about that, I got a little carried away with my answer. No, it was good to hear your passion for this. I guess the thing that's interesting to me is that the Wingmaker's materials are esoteric, at least to me, and they seem to be explaining cosmological systems and psychological structures. How is it different than what you were just saying about the channeled information? Sometime this year the Wingmaker's site will be released on the internet, at least a part of it. Its only goal, according to its authors, is to introduce one concept, the sovereign integral. That is the fractal seed for the inception point. The second phase will introduce practical behaviors, to support the sovereign being, in their deprogramming of what it means to be a spiritual person. The third phase is to anchor the inception point, and create the crack in the wall. You've talked about the crack in the wall as the inception point. Can you elaborate on that a bit more? I will, but first let me state something that I want to mention before I forget. The youth of this world are impressionable. They're transitioning from the subconscious implants, of their parents and forefathers, to the creation of their own personality. They want to be different, they want to express themselves uniquely, and this opens them to influence. Where does this influence arise? Increasingly it comes through technology and the culture creators of music, entertainment, games and books. They bring the tools for youth to knit their unique layer of personality, that can fuse atop their genetic layer of consciousness, the subconscious. The glamour models, as the wing makers refer to them, convey a powerful elixir, which is to be selfish and self-obsessed. Narcissism is okay. Nihilism is the philosophy. This is prevalent and it will continue to spread, because this is a news program. When technology is unleashed, in the form of global platforms, the impressionable youth will inform their consciousness and personality layers by means of this underlying philosophical belief in nihilism. The way this seeps into the culture, through technology that helps codify personality in our youth, is one of the clearest examples of how Marduk's programming spreads. However more sophisticated the technology becomes, the more integral it is to the person, the more the culture creators will exercise this philosophical system in humanity. Why? Because nihilism is the belief in nothing, and if kids build their personality and belief system from these ingredients, they will be more obedient to their internal programs. Why? If you don't really believe in the higher reality of our world, you are more inclined to relinquish your sovereignty, or the I am consciousness. The phrase, selling my soul to the devil, is simply code for, I surrender to the will of Anu, and desire to let him take my life for his purpose. The unstated objective of that renouncing of the I am, is that Anu will give me something in return for my sacrifice. But the only thing that is returned, is slavery to the system. You walk your life according to your program, and the program ensures you are a puppet whether you are rich or poor. I'm glad you mentioned children. Do you see them getting this? And if so, at what age? If you mean, will children understand the information that I've shared tonight? Yes, of course. In many ways, they'll get it better than their adult counterparts, whose human 2.0 interface is more welded or infused into the human uniform. But the wing makers have written the material so that they will be understood by the prepared, and age is not the key factor. It is the preparation. Like what? I mean what constitutes preparation? Preparation is willingness to change. It is a lack of fear to embrace a completely new paradigm, and just as much, to release the old. If a person is poorly prepared for this information, they defend what this information tears down, which is nearly everything. They are not prepared to step into the vacuum of change that this information brings into their life. But why? It requires a lot of responsibility to accept this information. This information is unsettling because you are on your own. We are on our own. There is no savior, or army of angels, or ETs who are going to collect the good and bring them to their heavenly home. This also requires work. It is behavioral adjustments. It is impeccability. It is authenticity. It is attentiveness. It is caring. It is not a party. It is not surface cosmetics. This is a sober journey into self-realization, no matter how that realization appears. It is a commitment to that premise. You don't say to yourself, I'll walk that path, but only if I get to go to heaven and rest in paradise with beautiful souls all around me. That's not this path. For those who want that path, they can subscribe to the religion or cult of their choice and find those kinds of promises aplenty. This information is for those interested in breaking through to their true self 
and in doing so, not to rest and relax, or, or party and enjoy, but to serve truth through their behaviors, until everyone crosses into that reality of oneness and equality, from which we came. You were talking about the insertive behaviors a little earlier. I wrote some of them down, but I didn't hear the word love. Did I miss it, or is it missing for a reason? Love is not used frequently in the Wingmaker's materials in general. I think in part that's because the word carries so much baggage in this world. It has a kind of sentimental, codependent energy in terms of relationships, and then in culture it's used so casually, almost like a catch-all phrase that people use to greet one another like, how are you? Love is the unification force. It is only that, and yet, in many ways, that is everything. From the wing maker's perspective it is a very important word concept, even though they use it sparingly. The six heart virtues I mentioned, are considered the different ways in which love manifests in our behaviors. To this extent, love is expressed in these virtuous behaviors like gratitude, compassion, forgiveness and humility. In that context, the six heart virtues, collectively, are the expression of love in the human dimension. What about joy? It also seems to be missing. I know this information seems very sobering and unsettling. Because I defected from the ACIO, I have two forces that would like me to fail. This pressure has weighed on me. It had activated a degree of paranoia within me that I didn't know was possible. For this reason, joy, at least as it pertains to me, has not yet been a part of my personal experience. I'm sure everyone will receive these materials differently, especially the information in this interview. I'm sure everyone will receive these materials differently, especially the information in this interview. I would remind you that the emotional and feeling world is a functional implant, and the emotions we attribute to our heart or soul, are not truly coming from those sources. Then, where do they come from? The layer of the mind known as the unconscious generates emotions, but they are felt throughout the human body. The unconscious layer of the mind is interdimensional, so it extends from bubble 1 to bubble 2 which allows you to feel in the astral world or afterlife. When I express any of the heart virtues, I place them through the lens of oneness and equality. That's where they achieve their potency and expression. Then I take that experience and quite literally send it to my head region, imagining that experience is placed in the pineal gland, in the center of the brain. This is my way of mailing it to everyone through the unconscious mind. Why do you call them heart virtues if emotions are generated by the unconscious? The heart is a metaphor for the portal within each individual. It is relatively free of the human 2.0 interface and mind functional implants, partly because of the electromagnetic field it produces, and partly because of its physical dynamics. The wing makers suggest that the heart virtue should be experienced and expressed first in this region of the body, instead of the mind or head region as a way to isolate the tendency of the mind to simulate these emotions from the unconscious mind layer, where they, by definition, lack the same potency of expression, because they exist in separation. It sounds kind of complicated. I prefer to look at the flip side. If I do nothing, if I go sit quietly, in my chair and meditate, or study religious scripture, or pray, how am I supporting the progress of this reality? If this world remains ensnared in deception, that's complicated, not just for me, but every being in Bubbles 1 and 2. One of the things you've mentioned frequently is this notion of oneness and equality. I understand the meaning and import of the words, but these are certainly not new concepts. Doesn't every spiritual teacher say this? Not all, but some do. You can go back 2,500 years to Heraclitus, who announced that all things are one. It is an important concept of human philosophy, and to some extent modern-day physics. With regard to religions, often the founder says one thing, and the followers, who organize and interpret the founder's words and teachings, alter it, but oneness and unity have not been mainstays of religion, particularly in the context of behaviors. The wing makers are focused on behavioral intelligence, expressed through the lens of oneness and equality. The I am, we are, is rooted in this principle. 
It may not seem like a big deal to adopt this simple philosophical perspective, and frankly, it isn't, because they're simply words and it's only a concept, but if it's genuinely adopted and anchored in the core of your belief system, then you can possess the necessary commitment to express this in your behaviors. And this is where most people will probably have a problem. The human 2.0 interface is full of programming from Marduk and the human unconscious. It is weighed down in this quagmire like a person caught in quicksand, struggling to find a rope or anything solid to pull themselves out. The rope in this case, is the simple framework of I am, we are, and applying it through our behaviors, but it has to line up. If you adopt the framework, but your behaviors do not reflect this, the rope disappears. The unification of all beings in all dimensions exists. It's only when you step out of quantum space-time, that you realize the illusion of separation, and retaining this basic truth of oneness and equality in a human 2.0 spacesuit, is no simple task. That's why it must be more than words, and the words must be practiced in the now. Why are the wingmakers doing it this way? It seems so innocent, I mean, asking people to become self-aware, and practice insertive and resistive behaviors. After hearing all of what's happening in the triad of power, it seems like we're using slingshots against their stealth bombers. They want a money system that makes us perpetually indebted, slaves to the dollar, and they want this money system to be one currency. The most powerful people on the planet with access to the best technology, the best weapons, how can we expect to prevail if they want transhumanism? To understand why the wing makers are focused on the sovereign integral process, you first need to understand why the triad of power is focused on their plan. The triad of power believes their one world concept is the right concept. They want to unify humanity through a money system that they control, utilizing technology as another means to unify. Unity. In their minds, it's more like shepherding the human herd into easy-to-manage corrals and monitoring them for any rebellion. Their form of unity is a chimera. It is theater for display purposes, and nothing more. Their form of, we're all in this together, let us protect you, is simply more illusion and deception. Their plan for human 3.0 remains fused to the same functional implants, the constitute human 2.0, and that is separation. As I said earlier, they are here to prepare for Anu's return, whether they are conscious of it or not. All aspects of the power system, including major religions, are here to prepare. That is their watchword, prepare. The Anunnaki have one dominant belief in humanity, we are weak, because we live in fear, and separation. We do not stand up to the drip 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 of indoctrination, or the slow, but persistent evaporation, of our personal liberties. Now, remember that the Anunnaki, and their triad of power are both calculating and patient. What they established in our distant past, is beginning to come to fruition. The finite, 70 year life of a human being lacks patience. It is programmed to be impatient. This is against infinite beings, that see timelines in hundreds of thousands of years, and can program individual human beings within those timelines, to achieve precisely what they want, if human beings agree to it, if they don't stand up. The Anunnaki do not embrace a sovereign integral process. The notion of oneness and equality seems like a weakness to them. They believe they have the upper hand in this chess match. They foresee checkmate. Humans will fold. The sacrifice of Princess Diana last August was symbolic of the vibrant queen being lost on the chessboard. Those are the kind of messages they make, the kind of bold announcements. They do this out of a feeling of certainty in their programming, and patience. When I say programming, I don't mean just the internal interface that Marduk has programmed, but also the programming of the unconscious mind through the media, culture, religion, politics and economic structure. The combination of these forces is really the cause of their confidence, because they see our fall as an inevitability. Now, to answer your question, human beings, even those with Anunnaki DNA, can become self-realized of their true nature through a simple process. It doesn't require that they meditate and pray all day, or retreat to an ashram. The sovereign integral process becomes a natural part of the life expression of the individual. If enough human beings can embrace this process, or something like it, the crack in the wall will expand, the wall will become less stable, and the world of separation, in its brittleness, will begin to crumble. The life essence is what we have on our side. This is not a slingshot as you put it. It is the infinite force that powers every object in the universe. Life is inside us, 
and it exists in one and only one state. Equality and Oneness. The entire hologram of deception, as created, and curated by the Anunnaki and their cohorts, that is not life, it is the exemplar of separation. Life is truthful and authentic. Separation begets deception, unworthiness and fear. If enough human beings awaken, if we begin to realize what's afoot, what plans are being made to further enslave us, and ensure that we remain a part of the hologram of deception, life will move inside us and we can collectively stand up and stop this, but it has to be done in the right way, with honesty, forgiveness and compassion. The alternative to separation must be expressed in our movements and practices. We have to model these behaviors as a collective entity. That is the definition of the grand portal. You've talked a lot about separation. Can you elaborate on why this concept is so prevalent? If you look at the material that comes from religion, spirituality, philosophy, psychology, even the arts, you will see that much of this material is designed to be an owner's manual for our functional implants. They support the human 2.0 interface. They instruct us on the methods and attitudes to activate these systems inside us. I've previously mentioned the three layers of the consciousness interface, the conscious mind, the subconscious and the unconscious. The unconscious is where we mostly operate in terms of our behaviors and perceptions. The unconscious mind layer is deep and penetrating, and it is universal. As I said, it's how Anu uses the oneness concept to his benefit. We are one in separation. The unconscious mind is one. Separation is a fractal energy. It infects everything within the hologram of deception to such a degree that it's not recognizable. No matter how well-intentioned a person or organization might be to convey true information, what often lurks behind the information is this fractal energy of separation, and its use of comparison and judgment, and all the other tools of separation, that distill down to fear and unworthiness. It's as if the internal programming of Marduk, and the external programming of the triad of power, echoes around in all content of all times and cultures, so common and accepted, as to be unnoticeable. We have accepted separation, because it seems normal. Thus our behaviors and perceptions, driven largely by the unconscious mind, embody separation, and the vast majority of us do not even know it. Okay, but then how do we become aware of it? A person must understand that they are being programmed, that's a starting point. If you don't accept this basic premise, then why would you choose to change? If you do, then observe the programming inside you, within others in your environment, the larger world, and begin to see how subtle this programming is. In many ways, to observe this programming requires us to be neutral, so we can simply observe our internal states and the messages therein, as well as those of the external program, which come via television, the internet, email, newspapers, magazines, direct mail, and so on. It isn't critical that you know how every program is expressed into your life or what its esoteric meaning is. What's important is that you understand you are being programmed and you seek an internal source of direction, inspiration and movement. The sovereign integral process is focused on you, the individual, directing your own self, life essence, to express itself in oneness and equality. That's it. If you do this, then you are releasing the hold of the programming. For some this can be done quickly and for others it might require more diligent practice. Can I do this and still be a Christian or whatever I was raised in? I suggest that anyone who resonates with this information, try it out. See how it moves them through their life path. If they want to remain in their current structures, see if elements of the sovereign integral process could be applied. But if you don't see separation in your current practices, then stay there, because you won't have the motivation to be a practitioner. But you just said that most of us don't see separation. I said that if you don't see it in your current practice, then you won't be motivated to change. This process is all about change. Make no mistake about it. It is not selfish in any way. There is no burrowing into the bedrock of a belief system here, that will make you feel superior, or privileged, or wise. There really is no belief system here, other than the sovereign integral process. There is no structure, no organization, no master, no hierarchy, no one is above another or below another. Do you see? This is not an organization of this world. It cannot be of this world. Otherwise it is subject to separation. The only way the human 3.0 SI manifests, is inside enough human beings who exemplify this process, 
who anchor this new consciousness of conduct on this planet, and share it through their behaviors and unconscious mind. That's the only way, and not everyone is prepared to do that. What happens if we see separation, but still don't have the motivation to make the changes in our behaviors? The functional implants of the human 2.0 interface are seldom easy to release. They will hold on to your life essence as long as they can. They want to drive the human vessel, not hop in the backseat and watch as mere passengers. That's against their program. So talk about this resistance from the functional implants. How does it manifest? I'm sure it's an individual thing. I don't pretend to know how it is for anyone else. I can tell you from personal experience that I initially dived headfirst into this process and rearranged my life. I thought I was doing a good job, and then a week or two later, I found myself back to square one, exactly where I'd started. It felt like amnesia. It was as if I had forgotten I was even doing a new practice. Admittedly, in my case, I had a lot of distractions in my life, but everyone can probably say the same thing. So I think this tendency, to return to the habits of the consciousness system inside our 2.0 interface, is the main way that resistance is expressed. Change, of the scope, is not an easy proposition. The human 2.0 mind doesn't like the back seat. So what did you do, to return to the sovereign integral process? Well, for me, I needed to direct the techniques inward. Explain what you mean. I was directing the hard virtues outward to others, but I wasn't turning them inward to myself. It dawned on me that the inward was probably the most important place to start. How did you do that? It takes great alertness to live and express in the now. Human beings have a tendency to live in our past memories or future concerns. This was what I was doing and it took me from the now. And the now is where our life essence expresses. It isn't in the past or future, only the consciousness framework pivots between past and future, so if you find yourself in there, you know you are not in your essence. When I realized this, I read from the Wingmaker's philosophy that breath was the magnet of nowness. It was the element that brought the human being into nowness by being aware of their breathing. I also learned that there were different kinds of breathing that enabled this sense of nowness to penetrate more vividly into the hologram of deception. The point, is that simply being aware of my breath, helped, as the wingmakers put it, to center me in stillness. This, by the way, doesn't mean that you're in a quiet room. You can be in a meeting at work, and center yourself in stillness through your breath. But by being in this internal centeredness, I was in a better position to feel my own sense of expression, and that's what was missing in my initial efforts to integrate this process. I didn't have a good starting point for my practice, of the heart virtues, and I was directing them outward, to other people or events, and not myself first. Once I made that adjustment, it helped me to identify my essence, and distinguish it from my mind system. Life essence is authentic in oneness and equality, and exclusively moves in nowness. The consciousness framework pivots between the past, present and future and operates in separation. If you express the heart virtues from the consciousness framework, especially outwardly, they won't have the same potency or effect. You've mentioned the idea of resistive and insertive behaviors, and I think I understand the insertive behaviors, in terms of expressing the heart virtues to oneself and others, but talk a little bit about the resistive behaviors. What are they, and how does that work? Again, you need to start from the point of distinguishing your life essence, in the now. Center yourself in nowness, through being still, and breath aware. Initially this may take some time, but it happens quicker with practice. Thought patterns that connect you to separation need to be stopped. Behaviors, too. You can simply say, I've identified a behavior that supports separation in this world. Let's say I have believed that Muslims are less moral than atheists, and therefore less likely to get into heaven, than someone who doesn't even believe in God. This is a belief or thought form that relates to separation. I can say, stop that, but it's not really effective for most people. I can resist the belief every time it expresses itself in my life, but many of these beliefs are so subtle and subconscious, 
that we don't even realize how they express themselves in our behaviors and choices. If you apply the hard virtues to yourself, like forgive yourself for having these perceptions, have some compassion for yourself that everyone is infected with these separation beliefs, from their subconscious and unconscious mind layers, be humble that making this resistive alteration is not just about you, but in a way, it's about everyone, because we are one. Appreciate the fact that you are working on this for the good of all. Have valor that you can stand up and resist these separation complexes that lurk in your programmed consciousness framework. You can see how I used the hard virtues to effectively deal with a belief or perception that separated me, not just from Muslims, though they were the target in this particular example, but when you draw separation lines around anyone, you're operating from the consciousness system implant, and it only supports the hologram of deception. Okay, but you're not suggesting that I look at rapists and murderers as one with me, are you? Well, that's just it. They are. You can't have oneness and equality and then say, well, that's true, except for this population of society, or these felons of the human race. There is no leper colony, where humans are excluded outside of the circle. The circle is all-inclusive, or it is an illusion. This is an absolute. Remember my statement, about the hologram of deception is a prison? Yes. There is no other prison inside the prison. We're all in the prison. All of us are prisoners, even those who are in the incunabula. There is no one who stands inside the prison walls, and truly knows oneness and equality. But then how does it change, if no one knows this? It's a process, both for the individual and the human race. We work on it, together. We resist behaviors of separation, and insert behaviors of oneness and equality. We disengage from the thoughts, ideas, beliefs, principles, people, organizations, currencies, food, clothing, fashion, toys, and everything else within the hierarchy whose roots are nourished by separation. When you put it that way, it sounds daunting, even impossible. It has to be done, and it has to be done by us. The question is, if it has to be done, when does humanity want to do it? Now? A hundred years? A thousand years? Ten thousand years? The wingmakers are clear about this in their writings, that if we wait until after Human 3.0, when man and machine become integrated, it will only become more difficult. Enslavement of life must end, at all levels. I want to shift to something that's been bothering me about this whole conversation, and that is the issue of a god. From your description, God, as we've come to think of him, or her, or it, is an illusion. It's really a being who presents himself as God. So the question is, is there a real God? Thanks for asking that question. I meant to bring it up on my own, and I think I sidetracked myself. Let's go back to the thought experiment about the bubbles. There is a presentation of a God, which as I've said, is Anu. This is the God that Muslim, Jew and Christian alike, revere and worship. This is the God who desires to return, and provide a clear supremacy over humankind, to direct humanity to a human 3.0, one world transhumanist existence, that would stretch into forever. As I have said, there's a life essence inside all beings, including the Anunnaki, and this life essence is infinite. If you understand infinite, then you understand it is outside of space-time. If a being is outside of space-time, it is not defined by polarities, like birth and death, creation and destruction, good and evil, and so forth. It is beholden to none of our vocabulary and concepts. Thus, when the wing makers decided it was time for this information to become available on Earth, it was offered, in terms of its text, as a bridge. In other words, it was decelerated to our language constructs. And other forms of media, too, like the music and art. Yes, but in a different application. All of this information needed to be encoded in a way that would be acceptable to two sources of scrutiny. One was Anu and his hierarchy, the other, the individual. Which is why the material in this interview will only be released when certain conditions are met, and the wing makers are reasonably satisfied that the information will not be taken down by the hierarchy or dismissed as a fairy tale by the individuals they are trying to reach. Now, when this deceleration occurred, they elected to release the information in phases. Phase 1 would be encoded in a way that would allow people to understand the world outside of the hologram of deception, but in a framework that's somewhat familiar, that's resonant with the evolving beliefs on the planet. Hence, the idea of first source, source intelligence, sovereign integral, human instrument. 
All of these concepts will be provided without contextual details, because if they were included, the information that I'm telling you tonight would be purged by the hierarchy. The entire event string would be taken down. The inception point of the portal and grand portal would have been mired in doubt. So, it will be dispensed in the manner it must. This is not in my control. Source intelligence is the energy intelligence of first source, that serves to accelerate the expansion of consciousness, and supports those who desire to unlimit themselves. What does this have to do with the existence of a god or not? I just wanted to clarify that the word god means multiple things and it needs to be clear what meaning is being used. That's why, in part, the wing makers don't use the word god but instead use the word first source. However, in their later philosophical writings, after Chamber 6, they don't use this word, for the reasons I mentioned. But these are very subtle intonations in their writings, as they try to weave their messages into our modern day culture without being targeted by hierarchical censors. There are literally people who censor this information? There are people who censor and control information everywhere, in the media, the government, the military, the sciences, education, religion, everywhere. The hierarchy has a complete army of censors. The vast majority don't know who they really work for, they're just enforcing what they've been hired to enforce. It's just a job. But technology platforms exist primarily for censorship. Intelligence gathering enables NSA censorship and information control. It's their job to filter, control and manipulate information. The system of mass surveillance isn't deployed to protect the masses. It's to control them, to keep them inside the prison, from a news perspective, and controllable, from the elite perspective. You're not saying that the NSA cares about things like this, are you? Not in the sense of how God is defined, but it's through their surveillance platforms that those in the hierarchy are alerted to information that details critical aspects of their hologram of deception. That kind of information is fed upstream to those who do care. If that's the case, then whenever this gets released, it'll get censored. So what's the point? This is all about timing. If this gets released it will be because the wing makers have confidence that it will pass censorship. Something will have happened to enable it. I'm aware you haven't really answered my question yet on God, so I do want to come back to that, but with the internet these days, couldn't you just drop this whole information on the public at one time? It'd go out to a few thousand people and then they could put it out on other sites and it would just grow in geometrical progression. How could they hold it back or censor it? It would be modified. It's a complete set of information. Once it got out in that format, some would claim their version is the original and others would claim that their version was the original, and they might be as different as black and white in some areas. It only creates confusion, and once there's confusion, it's impossible to bring clarity. In intelligence circles this is called reputation destruction. Think of it like this. You have a set of information that is targeted to specific beings that live everywhere on the planet. You wait until there is a communication system that can get to each of these beings. You have to make sure that the information is as pure as it can be, but still get past the sensors, so you encode it and release it in phases. The first phase is released as a real event, to test the waters of reaction. The second phase is released with new content and modifications, emphasizing that it's a mythology. This is to reassure the sensors. The third phase will get more involved in practices and behaviors, but without full context. The fourth phase will probably be the human portal. The fifth phase will probably be this interview. And the phases that follow will depend on how this interview is received. So every release is being observed by both the hierarchy and the wing makers. Okay, let's go back to the God discussion. Yes, so, to answer your question, is there a God? There are many gods. Some beings present themselves as gods, and some beings manipulate others to such a degree that they become regarded as gods. And then there are collective intelligences that move between the quantum membranes, and simulate god-like qualities of omniscience and omnipotence, but they are not gods in the sense of being the creator. There are even some beings that present themselves as god through a human channel. The view of the wing makers, is that the oldest civilizations in the universe, believe there is a creator, but that this creator, known in the wing makers philosophy as first source, is so fundamental, that it is the fractal essence of all life in all variations, it is the quantum zygote of life at the most foundational level. It is not truly knowable as we think of knowledge. It is experiential through sound that evokes this tone of equality spoken of in the wing makers philosophy. 
it's not apprehended through the mind, which makes it hard to describe or convey. This is the problem with anything so elemental that it all but disappears. How do you convey it in such a way that it can hold a human being's attention? So there's a God, but it's unapproachable, is that basically it? Yes, but I want to mention that the relationship is to a creator, not a God. The creator is in all life. God is more of a parent, and in religious circles, a father figure who is humanized to such a degree that we can pray to God to give us things, help us remove obstacles, crush our enemies and so on. Creator is aligned to oneness and equality, while God is aligned to separation and fear. First source is the creator of life, the manifest reality of all existence. The creator lives within life as the infinite spark that connects all life as equals in oneness. It is not here to be humanized. It cannot be humanized, or for that matter, reduced to any other life form or thing. The creator is the conjoining of all existence in the equality of oneness, and when that occurs, then God exists. When it does not, there is no God in existence, only a creator. It is really that simple. As it is said in various religious texts that God created man in his image or likeness. And provided you understand Anu as God, then this is a reasonably true statement. However, the Creator created the infinite spark that animates the human form, and so the sovereign integral is the creation, and Anu had nothing to do with this. He merely figured out a way to enslave it. The last thing I'll say about the concept of God, is that it's used by religions to separate ourselves from responsibility. It allows us to say, I'm not responsible for poverty, or war, or child abuse. There is a God who is much higher than us. God created the world, he is in charge. If he allows war and poverty, who am I to bear responsibility? The wrongdoers will pay in hell, and the tormented will reign in heaven. So God, or the concept of God, releases us from responsibility. The Creator, on the other hand, is not this way, because we're all bound in oneness, and what happens to one happens to all and therefore, we're all responsible for allowing separation to rule our behaviors. It's important to recognize the difference between the constructs of Creator and God, especially within the hologram of deception. After hearing all of this explanation, not just about God, Creator, but the whole interview tonight, why couldn't it have just been released as it is defined in this interview? Why even release the first phases if they lacked this context? I've tried to answer this already, let me put it this way but understand that this is speculation, so take it as such. There's no assurance that this will get released or stay released. That's one reason. There may be other individuals that need the earlier phase information, because it bridges their current beliefs better than the later phase information. That's another reason. Remember, this is as much about redefining the unconscious mind as it is anything else. The unconscious mind is the back door that the Anunnaki left open in their designs. That's where the hacking vector can come in, and that's how the Wingmaker's information was brought in. What do you mean by hacking vector? The Wingmakers are hacking the program of our consciousness framework as designed by the Anunnaki, programmed internally in the DNA and functional implants by Marduk and programmed externally by the hierarchy, also known as the Illuminati, Globalists, New World Order Elite, Bilderberg Group, etc. The wing makers must come into these programs from vectors that are less protected or defended by sensors, and have the potential for quick spread. Bear in mind, that while the functional implants of the human 2.0 interface are programmable, should they become hacked or altered, they can be upgraded or patched just like software. So the ideal method to enter the human domain is to enter through a backdoor, appear harmless, even part of the order, and then quietly see the fractal process that can spread through the unconscious mind layer. That vector is not altering the program from the hardware or software perspective. It utilizes the consciousness framework in the human 2.0 interface without changing its programming. It's like an app riding on top of the operating system. It needs to be invisible until certain conditions are met. Once those conditions are met, it can be released, 
and once it is spread, it cannot be stopped. I'm not familiar with the term app. What does it mean? It's a software application that's not part of the OS, but uses the OS or operating system. If it isn't changing the consciousness framework, then what's it doing? It allows individuals to initiate their own sovereign integral process, which allows them to release the hold of these systems on their life essence. It's less about modifying or changing the program, than it is about releasing the hold that these programs have on the consciousness of the life essence. Okay, I think I understand, so I want to go back to this process. You said it has two main parts, insertive behaviors and resistive behaviors. You also mentioned something about breath, but I didn't hear you say anything specific about it. Yes, the breath is an important way to bring you into self-awareness. It's like a quantum light turning on that illuminates your life essence, that part of you that is not of the human 2.0 interface. You're able to sense and begin to re-experience this infinite being that is you. The breath is something that anyone can use without a lot of complication, and obviously, it's always with you. It doesn't require any technology or expertise. It's really just a way to shift attention to the core of yourself. The wing makers write about quantum breathing or quantum pause. It's a technique from Philosophy 7. Can you explain it? It's very simple. You breathe in through your nose for about 2 to 4 seconds, or whatever's comfortable for you. Once you've filled your lungs, you pause or hold your breath, for the same amount of time you breathe in. While you're in the pause, holding your breath, feel it like a suspension of time, and fill that space with the feeling of I am. Okay, sorry to interrupt, but tell me again, what is the I am feeling? How do you define it? It's the sovereign aspect of consciousness. It's not the personality that defines your human experience, or you typically associate with as yourself. It is the infinite consciousness of you. It is also one. High is one. It is one thing, infinite life. It is not the mind, nor the heart, nor the body, nor the feelings and emotions of the personality. It is singular in its depth and silence. Okay, go on. After you hold the breath in your lungs, and anchor it with the I am feeling, you exhale through your mouth, again for the same period of time, and then you pause again, your lungs are empty, and as you pause, you hold the feeling of we are. Then you repeat this cycle until you feel you're done. Can you explain the we are feeling, too? This is a sense of connection to all. The sense that you are connected, and that the I am feeling, you held a moment ago is being shared with all. I use the out-breath pause, to place any of the hard virtues that I'm working on at the time. For example, I might be working on the virtue of compassion in my personal life, and I can hold that feeling in that out-breath pause and imagine it as being shared with all. I think I understand what you're saying, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but how can this possibly compete with the globalist agenda of world takeover? It's a fair question. But look at the reality. There are many who've protested this enslavement. Throughout history there have been people that have come to this realization through various means, and they alerted people to this deception. They may call it a conspiracy, without really understanding the depth of this deception, or its ultimate plan, but in whatever way they know of this, and at whatever level, they all experience fear. The fear is that we're powerless to stop them. The capstone of the elite have been planning this for more than 11,000 years, before Human 2.0 even existed, the plot was devised. They have powerful interdimensional beings that know humanity on an intimate level, because they literally created the human being, and they can program humanity with such granularity, as to define our life paths down to our day-to-day -day choices. How can one possibly defeat such an antagonist? They have the money, they have the politicians in their pockets, they have the defense and protection, they have the powerful relationships everywhere in the world, and they have the most powerful technology, in terms of surveillance and weapons. Their innermost circle is impenetrable. We can be wide awake and aware of what's happening, but awareness doesn't suddenly, in itself, change the chessboard. They taunt us to protest. Wave your signs, publish your websites, fling your fists to the sky, investigate all you want, it won't change a thing. They will tell us to our faces that their power is inexhaustible. This is how they think. They want us to feel this futility and have this overriding sense that the end game is unavoidable. They want us to believe that we are powerless. Remember, they are securing the world and its populations for the return of Ainu. That is their program, and while only the capstone of the elite understands this plan, it is enough, because the downstream operatives are loyal, programmed entities. 
All one needs to do is to watch Madeleine Albright in that 60 Minutes interview, and you will understand how they have been programmed to think. I don't think I saw that. What did she do? About a year and a half ago, Leslie Stahl of 60 Minutes asked the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Madeleine Albright, if the death of a half million children was worth the price to essentially punish Saddam Hussein. Albright responded that it was. You see, this is the enemy that holds power. If they can justify killing children, they can do anything. The wing makers have written that it isn't the protests that will change this enemy. If we shout at them and practice resistance with our guns in the street, they will only squash us. To bring their objective to a halt, we need to push down the wall, and we can do this by being practitioners of the sovereign integral process or anything similar. If human beings become self-aware, deprogrammed entities, who understand specifically how we have been enslaved and for what reason, we can collectively push down the wall that separates us from our true selves. This creates a chain reaction that affects everyone, including the capstone of the elite. The wall falls for them, too. It's using the consciousness of the life essence, to reveal the human 2.0 consciousness as an invented reality. It's weaning from the hologram of deception, to the reality that all life exists infinitely, as equals in oneness. Okay, but how do we know that we'll be successful against them? We don't, other than what I said before, that the wing makers are humans who have time traveled to share this sovereign integral framework. I realize this sounds like science fiction meets David and Goliath. I can appreciate that, but I'm explaining what I know as directly and honestly as I can describe it. If anyone hears this interview, assuming it's released sometime in the future, then you can decide for yourself if what I say stands up to your scrutiny. I would just caution some to consider the possibility that should you dismiss it, your reaction could be a programmed response. It is your consciousness framework that is sensing and responding. Consider this before you dismiss this information as fiction. But how would a person know this? I find myself doubting this disclosure. I don't find it very plausible. As a journalist I'm trained to be suspicious of sources, and as much information as you've shared with me, I find myself wondering how this is possible, and I haven't heard about it. The hierarchy practices deception by controlling the buttons on the machine of absolute power. This machine is... But you yourself said the internet was not something that they wanted to get out. True, but whatever technology is released, they will find a way to use it to their advantage. It doesn't matter what the technology is, they will find a way to subvert it, modify it and use it for their agenda. These are extremely bright beings that are obsessed with the centralization of power and control, so that Anu can insert himself without resistance. What if enough people woke up and rebelled? Couldn't we start a revolution and overthrow these crazy criminals? They are not crazy. They are deceptive intelligences, who have lost all sense of connection to their true selves. In many ways, they are the ones who are lost, and because they are so lost, they have led the unsuspecting to their haze of obedience. We have followed them. That's our responsibility. The material is here, in this interview, to wake up. But it's one thing to wake up, and it's another thing to know what to do about it. You mentioned a revolution, according to the wingmakers it would be a waste of life. They are not going to relinquish what they have worked so hard and long to produce. This will only change when the wall is pushed down. The wall is the human 2.0 consciousness framework that is programmed within every human being. The wall needs to be pushed down, and the way this occurs is not through protest, storming the gates, or shaking our collective fists in their face. It must be done through individual self-realization, and this, because of our programming, requires us to follow a process that enables us to become self-realized of our life essence. If we remain in separation, we can't solve the problem of separation. If we remain in deception, we can't reveal anything of our true nature. So we need to see all, as one and equal, in this hologram of deception, and that includes the capstone of the elite, as much as the poor and hungry. I don't see how people will be able to do that. Maybe I'm a pessimist, I don't know, but will enough people really be able to do this? At the heart of this whole situation is a single reality, and that reality, as hard as it may be to touch, is that we are infinite beings. Everything that is of space-time is within the hologram of deception. Everything. 
Which reality do you believe is more powerful and lasting? Whatever is infinite. Don't believe the programming that you are powerless. The sovereign integral process demonstrates that you are not merely a programmed life existence. I feel I could go on with this conversation for another couple hours, but I also sense you're trying to close it up. How are you doing on time? I can go a little longer if you have more questions. I have lots of questions. How about if we take a short break and I'll take that time to review my notes? And then I'll try and keep my next set of questions to another 15 minutes or so. How does that sound? Sure, that's fine. Great, then we'll begin in 10 minutes. The tape is rolling again, and I've got my questions. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, good. Does it seem like a strange coincidence that the Labyrinth Group was trying to create time travel technology, and you stumbled upon the Wingmakers who are time travelers? Not entirely. But how do you really know that they're not aliens or some other non-human beings? Sometimes you just have to take things at face value, when there's no evidence to the contrary, and no evidence that would support any reason for them to misrepresent themselves. Through all of my discussions with you, this interview is like someone coming into my home and rearranging all the furniture. What advice do you have for anyone who reads this and gets a little paranoid, or uneasy about this information, and what should they do about it? This disclosure is not meant to frighten anyone, or make them paranoid. It's meant to support them in their own awakening as infinite beings. That's really it. That's the information's purpose. This includes all of the Wingmaker's information in whatever form it's in. There's a core stability inside you, that's been sidelined in favor of a manufactured or programmed response to life. You are programmed to fear, because then you will abdicate your liberties to your saviors. And who do you suppose your saviors will be? Who is it that makes Saddam Hussein out to be a monster, while they kill hundreds of thousands of children, to prove their power is moral? The entities behind that power, are the ones who will step forward and claim to save you. How they will do this is an unknown, but I have no doubt they will do it. And every time they do it, the corrals grow in number, and the populations inside the corrals swell in size. The fences get higher. Those who remain outside the corrals will think they have insight or special information that allows them to remain independent or free, but they're still operating inside their human 2.0 interface. The only real question, as I see it, has two parts. 1. Do I serve truth or deception? And 2. How do I best serve truth? If you feel that the best way to serve truth is to protest, resist, build awareness about what is happening in the world, then do that, but I would recommend doing it from a non-polarity perspective. You can't fight separation with more separation, it will only polarize. It's important to feel that you are standing up, not in fear, or some other programmed emotion, but that you are aligned to your life essence, and an expression of that source within you, even when you protest. Others may prefer to undergo the sovereign integral process and focus on this more internal stratagem. There is no formula here, and certainly you can do both. But to know this information and then remain passive, a pure observer, is a programmed response, and that is not an answer to, how do I best serve truth? It is a denial of truth. mentioned earlier that the Anunnaki lent their DNA to the human 2.0. It suggests then that their DNA would be present in a lot of us. Is that the case? This is a very complicated subject. Yes, according to the wing makers, the Anunnaki, in an attempt to enhance human DNA, conducted, what we would call today, in vitro fertilization experiments with human women. They wanted their DNA to create a subspecies, that could endure generationally, to produce loyalists. The Syrians did the same thing. In terms of DNA tendencies, the Anunnaki were conquerors, and the Syrian progeny were colonists. That's being very general, admittedly, but in broad terms that was the nature of their bloodlines, when compared to their human counterparts. The DNA template for Human 2.0 was Anunnaki, but it had been altered. This is where the subject gets complicated. The Anunnaki are not physical beings. They did not exist in three-dimensional density as we know it today. The Earth, 500,000 years ago, was a very different place, in terms of its density, and the gravitational fields that bathed it. The Anunnaki were interdimensional beings, meaning they are infinite just as we are, 
but without the physical body. However, all beings possess DNA. It's the quantum equivalent of a blueprint. So they experimented with how to use their DNA to create physical beings that could function in accordance to their agenda, which as I said, was initially mining gold, but later turned to the enslavement of a species who would worship Anu. When the Anunnaki fertilized human women, it was with royal bloodlines, and this was not a coincidence. They wanted these royal bloodlines to sustain over thousands of generations so they could more easily facilitate their master plants on Earth. Was this a nationalistic thing? How do you mean that? Were Anunnaki bloodlines mostly Arab, Jewish, or Gentile? Were there certain characteristics that were noticeable in the physical body? The Anunnaki bloodlines were initially Babylonian and Egyptian, but they have spread into nearly all races. It probably wouldn't be an overstatement to say that nearly every person on the planet today has some fractional percentage of Anunnaki royal DNA. What were they, in terms of their look? I assume they look like us. Yes. It was Atlantean, Anunnaki and Syrian body styles that were effectively blended to create the human 1.0 prototype. All of these beings, though less dense, looked similar to a human form. Races did not intermingle, as they were very cautious not to intermix their DNA because they were uncertain of the effect and how it might pollute or mutate through their genetics. But remember, the human physical body was an experiment, and they literally looked at it as physical protection, just like we would look at a spacesuit. None of these races lived in the density of Earth, or an Earth-like planet. They didn't realize how Earth would interact with their creation and cause it to evolve in directions that they couldn't control or predict. Earth as I previously said, was like a random variable, imposing itself on the human body through its gravitational fields. The interbreeding between Anunnaki and human women took place around 6000 BCE, and it was a designed event, not some lustful dalliance with the daughters of men, as it is sometimes portrayed in Sumerian texts. This was part of a design to place a subspecies within the human race that would conquer and control the Earth's resources. It was to consolidate and centralize resources for Anu, and to ensure that the world's wealth could be placed into his waiting hands when he returned. The whole thing about LERM, Light Encoded Reality Matrix, and how the Labyrinth Group had seen it as God, I don't understand that if 15 had read the same information as you, how he wouldn't have come to the same conclusions as you. I know you mentioned that you had additional contacts with the Wingmakers, and this convinced you of the authenticity of the information, but why do you think 15 clung to his perspective? You can look at LERM as the connection between the Earth plane, and the non-physical planes, of the hologram, that Anu constructed inside our functional implants. LERM was the connective web, and it was bi-directional, meaning that Anu could be projected into any being's consciousness framework to be seen or heard, and it also meant that Anu could detect and view into the life of an individual being. LERM is known as the White Light, and the Great White Brotherhood is known as its guardians. They appropriated Jesus and Buddha as their foundational pillars, stole the concept of I Am, matched these elements with the White Light, that had been a factor in every religious, occult and esoteric doctrine throughout time, and announced in the 1950s that the Great White Brotherhood was a real organization. Soon after that, ascended masters began to join the swelling ranks, as human channelers began to be the spokespeople of these entities. From the Wingmaker's perspective, these entities are fixtures of the polarity plan, to keep human beings firmly anchored in separation, distraction and deception. What does this have to do with 15's decision? Sorry, I got a little sidetracked, 15 knew of the Great White Brotherhood. It's considered a very important element in the overall hierarchy, very near the capstone of the elite or what I earlier called the Incunabula. The Great White Brotherhood was seen as a means to bring occult or secret information to the planet, and it was designed to balance the movement of secularization, which was to essentially rid the planet of religion and bring science to the stage. 15 was not sufficiently convinced to make a break from the Incunabula and the Great White Brotherhood, he preferred to view LERM as proof of God, and leave his world intact. This is not, by the way, an uncommon reaction to this information. And intellects, as brilliant as 15s, will make this choice to stay in the known world instead of venture into the unknown. In 15's case, he had too much to lose. Why did the elite want to get rid of religion? First, I want to correct you on your choice of words. It isn't the elite, as most people think of them. The vast majority of the elite are corporate citizens, financial managers, government managers, 
political heavyweights, military commanders and the like. They are not making these decisions. The vast majority have no idea who or what the agenda is. That's why I refer to it as the capstone of the elite. These are ones who have been preparing the world for Anu's return. Now, back to your question, religion was seen as an obstacle to the one world order. The quantum world of science was flexing its muscles, disproving key elements of religious doctrine, and it would, if left unmanaged, verify the hologram, but not the deception. The Great White Brotherhood was launched to the public in the 1950s, just as the quantum world was beginning to signal its stature, but it goes back to the 18th century when it was referred to as the Council of Light, and even before that it was a concept held in many secret societies. The idea of ascended masters, communicating with one another telepathically, and instructing and guiding the affairs of men, gained some popularity with those who were disenchanted with organized religion. To be fair, some of the channeled information did come from beings that were considerably more informed than the average man, and they could bedazzle most people with their superior knowledge of the cosmological order and the structure of things relative to God, but their description and explanation was founded in the hologram of deception, while these masters supposedly channeled the secret or hidden knowledge to their selected students, who then wrote books and created organizations, this information continued to separate the worlds of light and dark, good and evil and those in the know from those who were. Not, they use words like love, ascension, truth, and God more liberally than organized religions, and God was always portrayed as a loving, congealing force. Angels and cosmic beings were also associated with these organizations. They not only appropriated symbols and constructs like the soul and eternal life, but they also created the ladder of consciousness that stretched into infinity in which the student was forever trying to learn more to progress higher on the ladder. The elevation of one over another. This was the key concept of the separation tactic of the Great White Brotherhood and frankly, all secret societies. Create divisions of knowledge, add a ritual or two, and promise more power and awareness as you, the student, walk the path. They don't talk about how to deprogram from separation, instead they reinforce it. You've shared information in previous interviews about the central race. In my notes, you even said they were responsible for our DNA. Are they the Anunnaki? No. No, you have to define DNA in two ways. One is the human instrument or body, emotions and mind system, and that stems from one system of DNA, courtesy of the Anunnaki and Syrians mostly. The second is the infinite being inside the human instrument, which is also based on DNA, which is the quantum blueprint of the sovereign integral consciousness. The latter is the DNA developed by the central race. In the second interview you made some pretty big claims about the seven sites of the wingmakers being a defensive weapon, and that this somehow related to the individual's experience of the wingmakers' materials. In light of this disclosure tonight, can you explain how this works? The entire import of the Wingmaker's disclosure is about the Sovereign Integral, and how humanity benefits when the state of consciousness is seated within the human expression. The requirement to keep this disclosure in the realm of science fiction and mythology was why I mentioned this defensive weapon. So you're saying this was just a story? That part was. You see, the Wingmaker's materials are, by design, composed of many strands of information. Some strands are storytelling, some are artistic, some are spiritual, some are conspiratorial and some are designed to be factual, coherent disclosures of what is really happening in our world. The strands of the storytelling encase the other strands, in a way, they shield these inner strands. I've already explained why it happened this way, and while some might feel it would be easier to just give the facts, if these facts were disclosed now, you would not have seen, heard or read this information, the Wingmaker's materials would have been censored or taken down and discredited. I'm sure there'll be a good dose of that anyway. When and if this interview was released, but the story strand was necessary to provide an acceptable container to release the sovereign integral process. But this concerns me that the information you've provided in the previous four interviews is created, at least in part, as a story. How do I present it to any reliable news source as true? You can't. So then what do I do with it? Either you will release it as a story, or I will. If you prefer not to, I understand. Couldn't you just tell me what parts are story, and what parts are true? I could, 
But this isn't how I've been asked to release the information. But I've invested a lot of time in this already, and if I invest my reputation as well, then I need to focus on the true parts. Otherwise, I can't substantiate anything when I'm asked if, in my opinion, it's a true story. Everyone wants to know the absolute truth. They want someone to point to this phrase, or that precept, or that doctrine and explain to them that that is truth. Believe it. That's been the game on this planet ever since humans begin to contemplate their universe in a philosophical manner. All the shared truth has gotten us where? Where we kill children to punish leaders. Where leaders lock people up in death camps. Where religious leaders abuse children. So I would ask you, what is the value of the information that has collectively brought humanity here? You want the signposts of truth. No one can do that, and your proof is that no one has. Why? Because we are sovereign and we must experience ourselves in this way, and not let others decide what it is we should or shouldn't believe, or what is truth or falsehood. I wish we didn't live in a hologram of deception, but that is our human reality, and whining about it will not change it one iota. Studying the supposed masters of truth will not change it either. I can show you a library of books that expound on esoteric information. Some of these books were written as non-fiction, and by all appearances they seem to be credible and insightful, and yet if you listen carefully to the words, you see how they are separating you from one another. How they define a hierarchy. How they define a soul that is always learning, a human that is always sinning and weak. How they describe a universe that is infinitely layered. How the light illuminates those who follow certain practices. It can be very subtle. They can be talking about oneness, but there are judgments present in the words, or recriminations if you don't execute the practice properly, or suggestions that you don't mix this practice with anything else or it is diminished, or join and promote this path over that one. Part of the sovereign integral process is to practice your discernment of what enables you to believe in you, not the universe or some master or teaching, but you, stripped bare of all of your add-ons, beliefs, thought patterns, fears, guilt, stories, judgments, blames, pretenses, everything that hangs on you from the past. If you could drop them all, everything you had been taught and told and programmed to believe, what would be left, to hear? Silence. Deep, clear silence. That is you. When you find that, you will then know that everyone has that, too. Anu does, Lucifer does, Jesus does, your neighbor does, your spouse does. Everyone. So what proof do you need to find that? What proof can I show you or tell you to give you that? I can't. I can convey a process that if you follow it, you might find this experience inside you, but that's all. The process is free, it only requires time. The process is not owned by anyone. The process is not part of anything but you. Once you stand at the trailhead of that process, it's yours to follow or reject. Everyone must achieve this realization of oneness and equality in life on Earth. That is our call to action as a species. And in my opinion, anyone or anything that tells you otherwise is lost. One more thing, the story strand may be exactly what activates someone to the sovereign integral process, and I think that was the point that the wing makers took with their information. Everything about their work is signaling the individual to the sovereign integral process, and the realization of the grand portal. If Anu is what we have been taught as God, then who is Lucifer? It is precisely for this reason that you have to be sovereign. Because in the world where Anu is God, it is easy to presume that Lucifer is the real bearer of light. But remember what I've said over and over, everyone is lost in this hologram of deception. If all are lost, how can anyone lead you to truth? They can't. The truth is self-expression of your infinite self in the human form upon Earth. That is the closest definition of truth that I know. It may not be the same for you or whoever reads this in the future, but this is my definition of truth. Does Lucifer advocate this? I'm not aware that he does. If anyone is not supporting my truth objective, then why would I let them move me in any other direction, even an inch? You ask who Lucifer is? There are a thousand ways to answer that question, several of them I already have. To add another definition, he is not a polarity of Anu or his puppet. 
At a fundamental level he lives in equality and oneness, the same as we. Is he awakened? I don't know. I haven't met him. I haven't talked with him. If I do, my first question of him will be, does he support the freedom of human beings, the kind I have just defined, and if he says yes, then I will accept his word until I see evidence to the contrary. If he says no, I will remove myself from his presence. If he says maybe, I would have a conversation with him and invite him to support this movement. Everyone is waking up. I realize it seems like the activation is in super slow motion, but in 70 to 80 years, a huge shift can occur in humanity's realization of what is really happening in this world. There is no way to hide this. It's already in the unconscious mind layer, and it will continue to spill out until we push the wall down. This is more a comment or observation than a question, but the sovereign integral process seems existential instead of transcendental. It also seems like a solo journey instead of an organized group who are supporting one another. Is my perception accurate? Partly, yes. I think the sovereign aspect is what you're picking up on. It's an internal process for the individual to develop within themselves, but the integral aspect is a collective, and I don't mean that as an organizational structure. This process needs to be outside of any organization's or individual's hands. It's not possible to own this or control it within an organizational structure. I think people can use the internet and email to support one another. Some will want this kind of support. Others may prefer to be left on their own. Relative to it being existential, yes, it is that. This isn't about ascending into the high places of heaven and hanging out in perfected realms of space, while your fellow human beings are lost, enslaved and corralled into ever-tightening spaces. This is about sharing the hard virtues and the truth of existence in your behaviors, here, on Earth. It is about making Earth a place where human beings can express their life essence, without the interference of Anu's hardware and market software, and to tear down the external programming that creates the parents of fear and separation, and all of their children attributes, like narcissism and hatred. If I decide to release this information, do I have to practice it? No. Can I have some time to think about this? How long do you need? Maybe a week. Of course. You can take more if you need it. Are you resigned to the idea that you'll be caught? I'm a realist. I don't think the ACIO will do anything rash. They'll simply do their best to quarantine me. What does that mean? I'll end up in a holding cell, off the grid. What about Anu? Anu is simply a name of the royal leader of the Anunnaki race. His name is symbolic of more than one being, which is the capstone of the elite. You could also look at Anu as the programmed existence of the human race. He exists in everyone to some degree. Anu's presentation of himself is that he's omniscient and omnipresent, and this is true in a certain way, so I have to deal with that reality. Everyone who wakes up and practices this process will meet this resistance in some form or other. But if people hear that they will have to deal with Anu, won't they run from this? Who's going to try and fight that, that machine? From the Wingmaker's perspective, thousands, and then hundreds of thousands, and then millions. The wall can collapse in an instant, when a critical mass is achieved. But won't this be accompanied with hysteria and panic? At one time I thought the Grand Portal was a technological discovery of the soul, and it would be on the internet for all to see and experience in the comfort of their homes. But this isn't like that, is it? No, this is more like a collapse of reality on a mass scale, where infinite beings suddenly find themselves awake inside a human uniform, and wonder what just happened. What if it doesn't happen? What if they win, and transhumanism 3.0 is the new human being locked into a world of separatism? What then? I don't know how to answer that question, other than to say that the information provided by the wing makers is a new inception point, which necessarily means a new path. Maybe it will take more time, but it will happen. It has to. We're infinite beings, and this fact cannot be bottled up indefinitely. I understand, but the whole concept of infinite beings, that's been around a long time. Soul has been around a long time as a concept. How is this any different? Yes. It's been around a long time, but it's been bottled up into three paths. 1. Reincarnation and Karma. 2. Be good and obedient and join the ranks of heaven. And 3. Ascend to a higher plane of existence and eventually become a teacher within the hierarchy. The fourth path, though not about soul, is that we are simply human flesh and blood and we have no soul. A person's soul is construed from one of these paths, assuming you believe you are a soul. Each of these paths, 
as I have already says, is within the hologram of deception. They do not lead outside, past the wall, and they certainly do not make the wall less stable. To be self-realized, as an infinite being, within a human body on Earth, decoupled from the controlling human 2.0 interface, is the fifth way. We've been living in a game show that has four doors, where an announcer keeps repeating the instruction, choose one of the four doors, while completely ignoring that there is a fifth door. This new inception point inserts the fifth door option. That's how it's different. I wish I could go on with question after question, but I think this is probably a good place to stop. I agree, Sarah. Okay, good. Then we'll bring this to a close, but before we do, I'll give you the last word. Well, first, thanks for your open-mindedness these past two weeks. Your questions were good guides, and for all your modesty, you grasped this information with great naturalness, which gave me permission to open up. You've served well those who will hear this, so on their behalf, thank you. I feel that I've given everything I was asked to provide. I realize I fumbled around at the start of this interview. I wasn't sure how to bring this out. I also know that some will want more information, but the critical material is here, in this interview. I'm sure there are more details and nuances I could have provided, but then, no matter how much detail I disclose, it would never be enough for some people. This is all about action and behavior, not reading or soaking up information from another person. The glimpse I provided is a good start, and that's all that's really needed for an inception point. I realize this may seem like a fantastical journey of fictional characters and unlikely events, not to be taken too seriously, but in my view, this disclosure of the Wingmakers is their most important. Thank you, Dr. Neruda. What is within us, was present, before the universe was created. Our inner, pre-quantum core, existed previous to space-time, before any extra-dimensional race enslaved us. We are not weak, or defenseless. We are not mere human beings, with 80-year lifespans. We are infinite, and we are all that is needed, to transform reality, so that each of us serves truth, because we see truth. Earth is not a playground, or a schoolroom, any more than we are gullible children. There is no new age, or end time. There is only the infinite platform upon which we all belong, where we rise up as sovereign integrals upon Earth. James Matt.